Hello everyone, before we get into this episode, it's important for you to remember to be empathetic and understanding for every single guest that I have on this show. If you enjoy this content, please make sure to subscribe and follow because I do release weekly videos every single week. Otherwise, enjoy the show. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to Deep Dives in the Minds of Esports. My name is Blake Panashevitz and this week I am excited to introduce my guest today. She has been a freelance writer for publications publications such as Polygon and NBC Sports Philadelphia, but is now a contenders caster for Blizzard Entertainment. Please let me introduce Evie Fang, maybe better known as Ham Tornado. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Hello, hello, thank you for having me. Yo, that is like, what an introduction, man. I feel like, I feel like a real professional. Am I I'm, no longer an esports nomad? Like, <laughs> look at that. My job is to make my guests look good. I feel like I do a pretty good job of that. Maybe someone who's into hosting might be like, oh, hey, he actually does good introductions. Let's pick him up yeah. occasionally. But uh, exactly. yeah, I'm excited. You no, know, you are a really good person to have on the show. I'm really excited for a bunch of the stuff that we're going to talk about. Um, I think it's going to be a, a ton of fun. So I always like to start off the show fairly simple for my guests before I start to get into like what made you the person you are today and why was that so great or horrible. Um, so before we even get into any of that kind of stuff, let's start it off very easily. Okay. You growing up hid video games to some degree from your parents. A lot of it was because of your upbringing. What was the first game that you actively hid from your parents and how did you get a hold of it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, you're asking all the right questions. So if any of you, you know, young Asian giblets out there need the need the insider tips. So the key is to get into PC gaming early, because even if you have a shitty laptop, you can still run, you know, some some like uh, RimWorld on there. You can run some like RPGs. Oblivion was one of my first. Uh, what was my actual first first game? I think it was Oblivion. And, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am something else that you would know since you've done your research very well is I am full of phlegm, so I apologize for any any uh Okay, if you have to cough it up clearing, and spit so. it out, I don't care. Like just <laughs> <laughs> like, No, no, no. It's it's I, I also have a mute button here that John John set up, so we're gonna try and make usage of that. But yeah, so like basically um my my first I actually did have a gaming system, a PlayStation that I got when I was like eleven. Um and it was old <laughs> and all of my other friends have already kind of moved on, but whatever. Um, and But we only had one game, Crash Bash, and it was a multiplayer game. So I couldn't play it with any by myself, so I had to rope somebody else in, and that made it like that much more obvious, right? Also, it was in my parents' room. <laughs> so there was like no sneaking past it. So what I got when I got to like middle school, I had um, I had we had like a family laptop, like an old like ran like windows xp or whatever and i could boot up a couple of games on that so i'd sneak upstairs in the middle of the night into the office and like play on the family laptop but when i really found freedom was when i bought my own and then it's like man you just like pop the cork off the champagne bottle and all the bubbles inside and you can't hold it back anymore i was just like gaming like all into the night and it not not good but also good <laughs> because there's this whole world right yeah. like i later on i found out um you know just because through my interest in like Bethesda and like I played Oblivion and Skyrim and then and I was like yo people are like super into this they're not like afraid or scared like oh I've been playing you know Elder Scrolls games ever since you know the, the Elder Scrolls arena or something like that and my parents were totally into it and they're the ones who brought me into that and then every now and then their friends come in for like D&D &D, and we have awesome sessions and everybody's just like a big family and I'm like Right, because it was always something like so. Like I, I've, I've said this before, but it was like so shameful. It was on like the level of drugs, yeah. right? Like it was, it was something so forbidden and stuff that good people don't do. And so, how and, right, do you get a PlayStation though? Like if they, if they viewed games this way as being so negative, how do you get your first PlayStation? Like how do, you, how do you convince them, or what makes them think in their head, we want to give our children drugs? Right. Well, it was. I think my. Man, that was a long time ago. Dude, that was almost two decades ago. We're old. We are old. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it was like my dad, who's a big impulse buyer and loves like electronics. And I was okay. always like, you want to buy it? You want a new iPhone or whatever? They just came out with a new one. And I think he was the one who like got it and then just like brought it home. And my mom was like, <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, but 
<clears throat> like we we also had candy at home and, and that kind of thing, but it was very tightly controlled. Generally, I just lived like a very very uh, highly regimented and tightly controlled childhood. So we also had a TV, but I was only allowed to watch one hour of it per week. And so when we had this PlayStation, we played on it for like the first night, and even my dad was like. 30 more minutes, 30 more minutes. <laughs> and wanted to play more. Um, and my mom was like, this is why video games are bad and da 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 da. And so we were only allowed, I forget, like we were only allowed like an hour of playtime per week. So that's, you know, she, she was just like, well, I suppose this devil's machine is now in my house and I have to deal with it, but you only get an hour. So. <laughs> okay. So then looking at that, you mentioned buying your own games, but uh, mm -hmm. you, I'm assuming this wasn't on Steam because you needed a credit card. Uh, to buy that. So uh, how are you buying video games? Because a lot of times you required a credit card or some form of ID, depending on the game, uh, mm. especially 20 years ago, because they actually cared a little bit more about those rating systems. Sometimes, at least where I was at, they did. Um, so how did you get games that way? Because you mentioned that you, you bought some of your own. Where are you getting money at the age of 11 or 15 or... So, so, <clears throat> uh, I didn't have any games on Steam and that was actually like a big thing is like anytime I needed to use a credit card for b basically anything, including like Amazon purchases for like random shit. Uh, I, I couldn't do that. So I would go to like GameStop and, um, and like, just like hand over some grubby cash you know, that I like scrounged up and like buy like a used copy of like Oblivion. That was, that mm -hmm. was basically how I just skated under the radar. Yeah. Cause my mom also watches the credit card like a hawk. So <clears throat> there's did, really no did, getting around did, it. Did you hide the games then inside your room? I assume yes. that you had a hide. Where would you hide them? <laughs> Literally, like when I hear about like other kids, like during their high school years and stuff, this like lasted all the way until college. Um, like <clears throat> when I hear about other kids in like high school or whatever, it's like, oh yeah, I had to like hide some like, you know, Bud Light in my room where I was like, I have my like weed stash or whatever that I keep in my cabinet. I'm like, for me, it was like, my video games just like hide them slide them under my calculator and my cabinet or whatever because my mom also like many chinese parents and many asian parents as you would know like don't have any sense of personal space either yeah. so she would literally just come into my room and open up all the drawers and everything and be like oh hey i helped you rearrange my your whole room you know out of kindness right because you live in a sty uh, but then right so you have to be very careful just hide stuff away um yeah, so it, it was just like, I, I imagine what it would be like. You living didn't in have the like a secret floorboard the... where you like popped open a floorboard and you're like putting all your games in there. Everyone else is right, like drugs right. and you're like, just my video no. games. No, just Skyrim. She can't find this. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, and so then where did you grow up then? Well, I know you went to college over in California. Did you grow up in mm -hmm. California or did you grow up somewhere else? So our, our family actually moved around quite a bit. And when I came to Colorado Springs again, people were all like, you've moved around so much. Are you military? You must be Air Force. There's a big Air Force base yeah. in Colorado Springs. Um, and I was like, no, no, uh, uh, my dad is just a workaholic, I guess. So <clears throat> my whole uh, childhood was like um, very highly regimented, but also not super... I, not, I wouldn't say stable because I had a lot of the creature comforts, right? My dad worked super hard and we brought in a lot of money. Um, so I, we were never lacking for things that I needed, like school supplies or yeah. food or anything like that. <clears throat> but there was never really any sense of permanence because I was born in Boulder. Then we moved to the Springs. Then we moved to Irvine, California. Mm -hmm. Then we moved to Plano, Texas. Then we moved back to Colorado Springs. And that was before, I, uh, before middle school. So <clears throat> just a lot of general shuffling around and upheaval i used to always like um i don't know when you're a kid you find like weird things to be proud of right yeah. like i could tie my shoelaces the fastest and i my thing was i've never spent you know two years in the same spot ha huh, but you can't say that right but um and then interdispersed between all of the uh, moving in the states <clears throat> my family um is chinese and all of my relatives live in china and Half of the family are actually communist officials, so they're they're pretty well off. But the other half are peasants, so the ones the officials were oppressing back during the Mao years. Yeah. And um, and because that's my parents' whole life, basically, is all the relatives live there. Um, every every year and maybe twice a year, we would shuttle back and forth to China as well. So that definitely didn't help. I mean, it certainly like enriched my worldview, and I don't think I would be the same person. Definitely not the same person if I didn't live with my relatives and kind of see how things are not in the states but um like <clears throat> growing up all 
during you know my formative years it was very much um it was very much like you could never get settled don't get used to these friends right don't get used to like this house or this street or anything because and we're not going to get a dog we're not going to you know plant any trees we're not going to like uh oh. set roots anywhere because at any moment you might need to leave and that kind of feeling of like just general traveling around and the nomad lifestyle maybe maybe has helped me um with my current career right because in esports a gig in new york might pop up and you got to go right so you can't have a dog um you know, you're probably difficult to like keep a house house yeah. right so boop's situation here with john is actually pretty special i'm like very grateful and very lucky that um he has kind of a root or an anchor in boulder so even if we're going around to la or wherever um we kind of have a home base to settle in yeah. so yeah okay so i have a bunch of questions for you that just came up yeah. after you did that so uh um, i guess we'll handle down it first. some coffee yeah you do, you do that. <laughs> uh kind of looking at your your parents you mentioned your dad was kind of a workaholic uh so my first question is was your mom a stay-at-home mom then yes okay big mistake so, i think i think big mistake but yeah <laughs> she was so she's a, she's a stay-at-home mom what does your dad do that has him traveling all over the place so i it really wasn't anything that um so he's not a diplomat. He's not a international lawyer or anything mm -hmm. like that. He is. Um, so he, both of my parents came to the States in 88 and 89, I think. So kind of with that first wave of second wave of Chinese immigrants, once China opened back up to foreigners, because there was an initial huge wave. I mean, we're, <clears throat> I wrote a lot of papers about this in like college and high school. So we're about to get a history lesson. I'm but okay like, um, this. But yeah, so like the first major wave of Chinese immigrants came during the early mid 1800s to the West Coast. And that's where you get all the stories of like yeah. the Chinese laundries and the railroad workers and everything. And there's still a, I mean, obviously China, uh, California has a massive Chinese community there that has kind of been in, become entrenched over a very long period of time. But then after that initial wave came over, all the Americans started getting, um, <clears throat> all the native born Americans started getting a little antsy in my country and stuff. Mm -hmm very similar rhetoric isn't it funny how the pendulum swings back and forth but um yeah so then the president at the time uh i forget who passed the alien exclusion act whereby it banned all uh chinese immigrants so then the flow was cut off and then china upheaval and shit you know, world upheaval went through a couple world wars and then Come 1980, when Deng Xiaoping um, became the premier, uh, the the president of China, he was kind of like, "Huh, you know, we're like struggling, and maybe we should find some new ideas and send our people out." So then he opened up China again, and that's the wave that my parents came over. So my dad, his background is actually in physics. <clears throat> he always wanted to have a PhD in physics. I mean, don't ask me why. <laughs> and uh, but then, being a very practical person who grew up in a time when individual freedoms were not as stressed right and and partly because of the culture and partly because of just the time when you don't get any choice man like you just got to do what you got to do in order to live right so i might not want to do this but i got to do this so he always had a love for physics but changed to become an electrical engineer so that he could have a trade right um and and so but he he always i i think for i actually if we're gonna like me and my dad have a really complicated relationship i think with probably with a lot of people who um you know maybe they're they're not necessarily because their fathers are bad people or anything like that but just the generational divide and kind of a cultural divide and he was always somebody who defined his life and his purpose through work so yeah. many engineers and this is like like i said he's it's not as though he's you know has to travel a lot but he just always was looking for the next best thing right and always felt that he could achieve greater and um and so we moved a ton and sometimes it was because the company folded like during the tech crash of the early 2000s right a lot of engineers a lot of tech people got laid off um but a lot sometimes it really was just because of his personal ambitions and wanting to further that so when um he actually doesn't live in the states right now when I was 11 or 12, he moved back to China, actually. So uh, he he was like, I want to do, my company has an opportunity for joint venture. I'm going to go. And then he just left. So a lot of people are like, oh, are your parents separated? Like, because they live so far apart. No, they're still together. And I don't know if that's a mistake or like a boon. But so it's been, 
his his first love has always been his work and um and so that's kind of where we just we just follow him wherever he wherever he leads you know he's he's the breadwinner so that's kind of something that you just have to do yeah okay so <laughs> your dad's doing that and your your mom you so you have a very traditional style of kind of uh chinese growing up right like mm -hmm. at least as typical as you can be considering your first generation american um what is that if you had to describe what that is kind of like to people to be in this like household in america that has huge roots back to china and has a lot of cultural impact from china but you're 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 in America and you have these different huge cultural differences. What is it kind of like for you being in that situation? Um, it's, uh, I, I'm assuming this, the experience would probably be pretty similar for anybody who's first generation when their parents are, uh, <clears throat> natives of whatever country, but you kind of split, feel a little bit split in two, right? Mm -hmm. There's always going to be, um, there, there's always going to be the American side, right? Who, uh, yada yada, red, white, and blue eagles screaming in the background, freedom, individuality, and so on and so forth. Follow your own path and shit. And then there's definitely going to be the the very very strong side where it's like, you know, <clears throat> what about long term? Think about your future. What about your future family, right? Um, what about your parents? What about your relatives and your cousins and their kids? Oh my gosh, I have so many nieces and nephews <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it, it is very much, of, you kind of have like a split personality. Something that um, I've noticed and is common in, is, is like you'll actually, like people who, who speak two different languages, like I also speak Chinese, <clears throat> Not super well, but your your voice actually kind of changes when you you start speaking another language because it must be because that language is so intrinsically tied to all the things that are different from what English is tied to, right? And so you kind of like it's like you shift into like a different personality. Um, and for for me, I I my family definitely values um, like personal personal success, mm -hmm. uh, and so. It was definitely a very foreign concept when I went to Berkeley for, for school and Berkeley of all college places, right? Uh, where people are like, yeah, I'm just going to be like a penniless poet forever. And, you know, I love dumpster diving. I was like, why, why would you, why would you do that if you could just be a lawyer? Right. For yeah. me, it was very black and white thinking like that. It's like, well, what's most, like, how do you value, how do you determine your value as a person? Right. Um, <clears throat> and for my family, it's like, do you have a good education? right? Do you, are you successful academically? Did you end up getting a job that pays you good money, right? To, to, to give you the most secure future that you could have. And obviously those things are all important. And I just assumed that that was so for the rest of the world, because if you could have a zillion money, why wouldn't you? But it's not, it's not that easy. Right. Um, and, and like personal desires, like <clears throat> never really came into never really came into the picture. So for example, I remember very, I have this very, very clear image and I was actually talking um, uh, talking to my boyfriend about this a little while ago. Like I, I was, I was like 10 and I was, we were in Texas in Plano and I went to, I was enrolled in a math school and a Chinese school. And so I had all, a load of extra homework. I didn't want to do, I never want, who wants to do homework? And I was sitting at the table and just crying, like, like Matt, like sobbing because I, just hate I just like hated this so so much you know when you're like a little kid and you just like get that feeling and nothing yeah. can really convince you that it's okay and I was just sobbing and my mom was just standing there and she stood over me for an hour because it was it was it didn't matter if you liked it or not this is just something that you did right mm -hmm. and the the philosophy was always if you were if you were just good at it you would like it right? Because then you'd be good at it. And everybody yeah. likes doing things that they're good at. So you just need to get good, literally just get good at math. These quadratic equations are not going to solve themselves. Do the thing. <laughs> and I was just crying and hoping that I could get out of it. But again, my parents never broke, right? And that was kind of, that was kind of the other thing. It's like, there's no escape. You got to do it. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm painting kind of like a very bleak <laughs> picture. Like I, I had, I had happy moments during my childhood, definitely. But like, this is obviously since, you know, 20 years later, I still remember it. It's something that really impacted me. Right. And, and then, um, and something, and again, ironically tied with a luxury, right. Where, you, it costs a lot of money to send somebody to math school, yeah. right? And I did Chinese school. I also did Taekwondo. I got my black belt when I was 12, not because Jeez. I wanted to, 
but because I had to. <laughs> I, I played piano ever since I was six. And, um, and that's actually something that I've continued to carry on. Um, but like my, and, and, and again, it's not because my mom was a, is a bad woman or was trying to do me harm. It was like when she, when she was a little girl, people were literally starving to death around her. Right. And she had to go into the field and harvest wild grass that now my grandma uh, used to use to feed pigs. But that was just what you had to eat. And so in that very harsh environment, right, it kind of feels like if you have it's like riches are just raining down on you in America. So fucking do the thing, man. Like this cost me so much money and it's going to give you like a better future and stuff. You do the thing. Um, but like <clears throat> she she would always use this really interesting kind of psychology. She would like, cause I never wanted to practice piano. And, um, and she would be like, well, if you don't want to practice piano, we can quit. I'm like, great. Can we just do that? <laughs> no, because I invested money into this. Yeah. Remember the investment lesson we had? We always talk doing investment lessons and talking about credit card debt and shit. When I was like six, uh, she's like, well, then you need to pay me back for all the piano lessons that I invested in you. And I was like, well, I can't do that. Like, can you give me an allowance? No, because you don't do your chores. If you did your chores, you would get an allowance. Oh shit. Okay. Well then what can I do? You just got to play piano. And then she would, <laughs> I remember also very vividly, like <clears throat> I was just having a tantrum and she would like hit me with a dictionary until I, I like stopped having a tantrum. And, um, and then she'd be like, go practice piano. And then I have to go, <laughs> And then I have to go and practice piano because how am I going to pay this piano back? It was like three thousand yeah. dollars back in you know whatever. So, so um, it was it was uh, it was a very interesting time, and I don't yeah. know like it's always you know you think back and you're like hmm if things had turned out differently would I be different right would I and and obviously I, I'm not like scarred necessarily by by getting beat with a dictionary but my internal thinking of like who am I right? What makes a good person? Have I achieved success? Because a lot of people would take a look at, say, me or Boop or anybody and be like, you cast contenders, right? I'm still casting open division or, or something like that. Isn't that success, right? But for me, no, never. Yeah. I, I feel like, I, um, you know, is there ever a point where I've reached success? I don't know. I don't know if like I can ever be happy with myself at this point. Yeah, I, I understand that, like, especially like doing like content like this, that is one of the things that I've noticed is like, there's moments where it like, I, I like there's moments where I feel good and I'm like, oh, I'm doing something good. Like oh, I've almost hit my subscriber goal for the year, which I was kind of shooting for. Um, mm -hmm. I'll probably surpass that. But is it good enough? No, it's re it's really not. Like that was like the bare minimum for me. And I'm like, there's so much more that I want to do. And I'm like, how do I get this out there? And so I understand. I I don't think people who are ever really successful though are ever really happy. Like, right? Like people who, who really get to high levels of success. I feel like nothing is ever good enough. And I feel like that's part of it. Right. It's, 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 you have to come to internal peace with yeah. yourself. And that's so hard because it, that like, if somebody could just be like, oh, you're doing good. And, and then that'll make you feel like satisfied, yeah. but that's, that's not how it works. Right. Like somehow, I don't know, I'm not totally into meditation or Zen or whatever, or find centering yourself, but maybe, maybe that's the key because it is, it really is like, I mean, fucking look at Tiger Woods. You're like, make a million money. You're undefeated in golf back in the day. And you have a banging hot wife and like a, a massive house and tons of shit. You know, you can have whatever you want. It goes out and cheats, yeah. right? Jay-Z, married to Beyonce, never enough, right? You can yeah. never find success. What <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. So I want to ask you a question about your parents, because you mentioned that back yeah. in China, you have two major different degrees of kind of like living situations with your family. You have the uh, more, correct me if I'm wrong, you said communist side that is more involved yes. in the, uh, that, and then you have the peasants. Was your the parents, yeah. was your, was your parents on like, is that two different sides of your, your parents' family? Or is that both of them have uh, family in both of those? So my dad's side are the communists and my mom's okay. side are the peasants. And um, my mom and sister are actually visiting the uh, peasant side <laughs> right now. Um, so, yeah, it's it really is a very interesting dichotomy. You wouldn't maybe expect the two of them to have gotten together coming from yeah. such different backgrounds, but they were young and stupid. <laughs> um <clears throat> are, uh, is, is there a is, a is there a point of like looking down on uh, like the maybe lower class or the, the peasant side oh, yeah. that is 
kind of there still that you have to deal with like when you go back over there which side are you are like are you accepted by both or are they like oh you're part of this uh peasant side or do they say well why are you going and visiting the side of the family they're like worthless do you have anything like that that happens back home um maybe some families do i'm actually very lucky that for the most part all of my relatives are very good people right. like um and very understanding very kind generous um folks the unfortunate thing is the my dad's side um, is was uh, all of my grandparents are dead now, um, but was ruled by a a horrible woman. My 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 dad's side grandma we call Nai Nai. Um, man, what a bitch! Like I I shouldn't slander the dead, but <laughs> or you know whatever it is, um, uh, whatever really language just, they yeah. receive in the in the you know hereafter, but uh. Yeah, man, not a nice woman. And she was not good to her children either, bred a lot of resentment amongst my aunties and uncles. So I feel like any any negative feeling that is generally held over the entire clan um, with uh, my dad's side of the family is is due to her her meddling. Ah, oh, man, I just like, you know, <laughs> so, like sometimes you just dive into f people's family and be like, what the fuck? That's like fucked up. So my grandma, she... Um, <clears throat> So, so to kind of paint a picture of how different the two sides are, my mom's side, like dirt, dirt people, mm -hmm. very, very little. My, my grandparents were orphaned when they were like four. And then my grandpa was orphaned when he was like six, like grew up from nothing, had a pile of kids, struggled their entire lives. But anything that they had was yours. Like people like to say that, but it was, it was literally, it was literally so. And I'm like, grandma, you know, cause I'm like a, a rich spoiled American. I don't need, you know, this stuff. And she was totally right. Um, <clears throat> so juxtapose that with my grandparents' side, my grandpa and my grandma, uh, Yeye and Nai Nai, on my dad's side, were uh, communist officials. They retired when they were 40, had an apartment gifted to them by the government, everything paid, they had a nanny for a very long time. Um, and again, I don't know if maybe my grandma and I have kind of the same thing of it's never enough, right? She was just always sticking her nose around and like trying to find like, I, I, just ways to like make other people feel horrible. I don't, why why would you do that? Like d d d there's so many other things you could do when she uh, my auntie was uh, always had a story when she was little every time she came home from school she would have to massage my grandma's back and then wash her feet. She was like 8, right? <laughs> My my grandma was somebody who who never who had children but never raised them because they always had a nanny and the nanny raised the kids and she was very much somebody who tapped into the traditional Chinese side of my children exist to serve me uh, in in Chinese culture there's something called fealty which is very very strong overarching concept which means like you owe your parents mm -hmm. basically like like your parents needs come before your own needs and I think that it's not a bad thing like you should care you should love and cherish your parents um but not if they're terrible to you and only to a certain degree because there's this chinese fable that is like put in like textbooks and storybooks where um <clears throat> as an example of how you're supposed to be feel uh filial uh, a, a mother was ailing and back in the day and even now meat was very expensive and this was ancient china so even more difficult to get your hands on and the doctor said she just she needs like meat she needs protein to to help her uh, uh recover and so the son being poor cut a chunk out of his own thigh cooked it and gave it to his mom and and fed it to her and then she ate it and recovered and like give of yourself to your parents in the most literal sense right and she and my grandma and my nanai was like somebody who believed that maybe because she, it served her needs i i don't know i i don't know but yeah so my aunties would have to like wash her feet and massage her back and like basically little tiny little slaves which were just her kids and and so um it, it had a little bit less to do with the fact that they were communist and that just Man, my grandma was not a nice lady. <laughs> um, so there are, though, still qualities that all, in, in Chinese we call it dakwar, big officials <laughs> exhibit and are so typical of Chinese, like, it's a stereotype for a reason. And, it, and it's like, it's it's a two-facedness so when i'm with my family or people i know i can be like a really sweet uh, like amazing person like one of my my third uncle on that side is is a is a, still a communist official and he is 
such a generous guy. He's always like, a round of drinks on me and blah, blah, blah. What you doing? And stuff like that. But then when he becomes his official, when he faces the public or, you know, a hotel clerk or uh, a, a tra- the person who clips the tickets on the train or whatever, yeah. then I'm a big official, right? And he's going to use everything that he can to get what he wants. Hmm. That, that must make a very interesting time. So I have to ask you, uh, like, mm-hmm. just kind of curious uh, about this. Um, how much do, like, the, the politics of China kind of come across to you? Is it something that you kind of pay attention to, that you care about, um, that you you focus on, or is it something that you're really not ever really worried about it? Well, uh, I I definitely worry about it. Uh, It's become something that I keep closer and closer tabs on since I've grown older. And um, also because my dad lives there now and it's not, my connection to China is not just, oh, I have a grandma who lives there, Mm -hmm. right? Um, it's, It's my my me, my dad right lives there and he now um he's now on the business side of things and he doesn't work as you know an engineer anymore yeah. um so he's very tapped into that and because of that i'm also very tapped into it but it's something it's like us news right mm-hmm. it's never good <laughs> it's always bad and you feel like you have to keep tabs on it but you don't want to um because man there is some shit going on in china right now that is very, very concerning, not just for the Chinese people, but for the international uh, community as well. The protests in Hong Kong uh, still going on. Xi Jinping, the current Chinese president, attempting to resurrect Mao Zedong's cult of personality and increase national and patriotic fervor in the Chinese people, which it doesn't take a lot. <laughs> so it's 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 very worrying. And a lot of times when I hear about the stuff that's going on, uh, say, say in, in the world of esports, because Overwatch and and many titles yeah. are working very hard to you know grab chunks of the Chinese market, but it is, um, and and while I feel that's that's great and very good, I I still like have have just a that little niggling worry inside my heart that somebody's going to get taken advantage of that you know it's 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 not all good and mm-hmm. I mean China recently banned Twitch, yeah so. Like when when you have a government that can make unilateral decisions like that, like we're just doing this mm-hmm. and the whole country about faces and shifts and turns, it's both amazing and also really scary because um, when you have control of the people like that, you can turn them to, to whatever and it might be good and it might be bad. So um, I, I feel it, it's a little bit difficult because like in, in esports, though, I feel like more growth is always good. Right. And I don't I hate to be the person that comes in here. Well, actually. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so fingers crossed that everything goes well. Okay, so kind of looking at growing up, you had the these two different uh, like cultural aspects. You obviously had the American side and then the the more traditional uh, Chinese side. Um, Did that ever conflict with you kind of growing up where you would you would try to rebel because you wanted to be one thing or the other? Or you had like inner dilemmas with yourself of like, oh, I'm supposed to be this, but I'm also this. Yeah, there's there's definitely that aspect. And I think. And I actually never really, never really rebelled quite as much as uh, some other people did. And I, <laughs> I always found it really funny because, like, when I was, when I was a teenager, and you were supposed to be rebelling, and I saw my classmates being like, "Yeah, yeah, my parents," but and I would be like, "Oh, I, I had such a, I was such a little shit, like, <laughs> and probably still am." But I was, I always, for for whatever reason, I always thought that I was smarter. Or that I knew more, or I could see what was actually happening, mm-hmm. um, and and so I was like, "Huh, you American teenagers, you don't even know how good you have it. Why are you rebelling? You know, when when you already have so many freedoms." And th- that's that's not why people rebel, right? It's yeah. it's about it's almost about a, like a journey of like self exploration and like how far can I push it? Like, is this mm-hmm. actually something that I can do? Um, <clears throat> So I never really rebelled in that sense. And actually it was, it was like, honestly, like when, when I like late middle school into like high school years are honestly like kind of a little bit fuzzy. It was a weird time um, in my life because uh, my, <clears throat> so my parents always had something of a rocky relationship, or at least that was what I, I saw um, yeah. as a kid. And my mom is very adamant to be like, no, he was great in the past and stuff. But my dad is uh, pretty, or at least was, he's gotten a lot better recently. So 
uh, but he he was always pretty uh, emotionally abusive, and um, and so especially when he went back to China and we kind of lost that connection right just the physical uh being like in the same physical space and sharing the same experiences and stuff and it became e e the relationship became even more tenuous and during that time because he was so uh it was so difficult i mean just keeping a family together like yeah. that when somebody is so far away is already hard enough without that person being extraordinarily difficult to work with and very demanding and my dad has a lot of that dakwar feel that um he treats his family more as employees i've mm -hmm. always maintained that it's better to be my dad's friend than to be his family because with his friends he works hard he is by the way a very very generous super charismatic outgoing person tells the best stories if you go to karaoke they always give him the mic, right? If there's a big table filled with food, a banquet hall, and somebody's got to give a speech, oh, give it to, you know, my dad, right? And and so he really knows how to command a room and that kind of thing. But he works to maintain those relationships. And I think he sees the family ties as something that's automatic and guaranteed. Yeah. So you're going to do it anyways. I, I, I don't, he's not malicious in that way, but that's kind of how it ends up coming out yeah. um so he 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 became extraordinarily difficult and um and so my mom had a, uh suffered a long bout of severe depression which is not what i which is i i only know that now because yeah. being in it right it, it's a little hard to see out and see what's actually happening and also chinese people don't get depressed right yeah. so we I, were actually I was just gonna ask this. about that how did how did, how did that right. kind of uh look or did you go through anything similar because she was going through any of that like what was that depression like because like, first start off with how was tradition looked in chinese culture then lead into that that's probably better yeah so chinese people don't talk about mental health um yeah. not just in china but i'm sure yeah. it, it stretches into korea and japan and many other asian countries right because um it, particularly in East Asia, uh, mianzi, face, is very important. And people would do all manner of stupid things to maintain face in front of other people, in front of the public, when, you know, their real family is, like, collapsing on the inside and that kind of thing. So people don't talk about it. Also, uh, many Chinese Americans or many uh, also Chinese immigrants who have come to America in that, you know, 80s, 90s wave um, are highly educated, highly skilled. And so that's just not something that gets passed around as much, right? You're talking more about what colleges your kids are going to, what their SAT scores are, what piano piece they're learning, because that's, it, it's, it's, a, it's actually a rather homogenous community. So that's just not something that really gets brought up. And it's definitely considered a sign of weakness um, because like, <clears throat> I have to believe that this is actually a really interesting psychological phenomena that some mental illness hits certain pockets, certain demographics harder than others, just yeah. internationally speaking. And um, and for whatever reason, Chinese people either don't suffer from depression as much because of that cultural upbringing, or it just gets quashed and nobody talks about it because it was my the way my mom always talked about it and what I truly believed all the way up until college when I had to kind of deal with this myself, um, was that depression is for people who don't know how to be happy. Mm -hmm. Like, and that it's your fault and not because of the, you know, whatever's happening. And she, she, I, like, she brought up an example, Rowan Atkinson, this is completely bizarre, but Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean, right? Beloved mm -hmm. and everybody loves him, uh, made a movie, Johnny English. And it did very poorly. And it was publicly known that he fell into a depression. And my mom said, why is he depressed? He shouldn't be sad because he knows why he's sad. It's because his movie didn't do well. So just basically think yourself out of it. Like mm -hmm. if you were a smarter, a stronger, a more intelligent person, you could figure out why you're sad, then just stop doing that. Right. And it was always, and, and again, it's not because, she, I mean, she was raised in a place where she didn't even know what a telephone was until she uh, yeah. until she was 20, right? So it's it's not because she was malicious. It was just her understanding of the world. But because of that, that was my understanding of the world too. So I didn't really see her in that depression. And also because my mom is just such a strong woman. Like whatever I say about her, she like still charges through. It doesn't matter what the hardship is. Like I would have just stopped functioning if I had to deal with what she was dealing with when I was a, a, a teen. I, I would literally have just like, laid in bed and died um mm -hmm. 
but she got up every day. She cooked three square meals every day, picked me, took me to school, picked me up from school, took my sister to school, picked her up from school, did the laundry, cleaned the house, went out and got groceries, paid the bills, you know, finagled with the insurance and all like, right. And the, the, the kind of biggest characteristic of, of that time um, was just that, like, I don't really remember a lot. And I think it was because I was probably also suff suffering through something very similar. Um, and, and, and it's kind of funny how your, your memory just goes a little bit yeah. when it feels like there wasn't really anything that was going on. Cause you were so, so closed and just, you know, just like, oh, okay, now I eat. Okay. Now I sleep. Okay, now I play Oblivion and get obsessed. <laughs> but um, but it, it it was kind of a fog. And then I went to college, and the and man, like my college time was like both amazing and also terrible. Uh, my one I bef right before I um, well, actually during my freshman year of college, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. Oh jeez. Uh, and it's uh, multiple myeloma. It's a very, very rare bone cancer, and usually hits the like over seventy set. So there's not a lot of research on it because it's so rare, and everybody just dies dies so quickly, right? Yeah. Um, there's no cure either, so it's it's a very grim uh, it's a very grim disease, and so add that on top of all the other interpersonal struggles that my my uh, family was dealing with, I remember I was like, I was like doing sit-ups in the hallway of my dorm and and then just thinking about like, what if my dad dies? Like, yo, he's like probably gonna die, man. Like what even, what even is that? How do you, like the, the, the harshness of the reality of those futures really hit me at that moment. And, and then, and then you got to struggle through like the practicality of what's going to, what are the next steps, right? Oh yeah. my God, my dad is so difficult. <laughs> like he has so many great qualities, but he has a lot of bad qualities too. And it was just a, a, a struggle because you got to come home, get some testing done, get that chemo started. But then that means giving up the lucrative job in, in China. He would travel everywhere all across the globe doing business shit and and he really prided himself on his abilities as a general manager of byd yeah. microelectronics research division and i i think like he had kind of a crisis of identity basically like his whole life up until this point was just a rat race how much more can i get how much faster can i get this career going what more can i what greater heights can i achieve and then suddenly to be like boom like not only can you not do that anymore you're probably going to die. Like, yo, having to face your mortality for somebody like him, very, very difficult. And so he didn't want to come back to the States. He actually didn't even want to come back to the States for a graduation um, because he's like, my work. Uh, and my mom was like, oh, it's very important for, you know, Americans to have their parents come to the graduation. Honestly, I couldn't have cared less because at that time, like, every time I picked up the phone, I was hoping it wasn't him. Right. So it would have been doing me a favor, but he came over anyways. She's like, you can get some testing done. Um, they ended up moving, my my parents ended up moving to Arkansas because the University of Arkansas Medical School has a famous uh, multiple myeloma researcher there. And one mm -hmm. of the only centers that's very well equipped to deal with this disease. I quit school, came back, took care of my sister through her last high school years. Um, and it was, it was pretty rough. And before that even happened, before my dad could even be convinced to come back for chemo, he uh, got, and, and like this shook me, man. Yo, this like fucking shook me because up until that point in my life, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you all these things about like what I realized about yeah. getting beat with the text, with the dictionary for piano and everything. Like that was just part of my life until that point. I was like, this is going to make me a better person. But then when my dad got cancer, he did not come back for chemo and, and he got suckered in by a con man, uh, a huofo, a living Buddha. He heard about this living Buddha through one of his friends, uh, his business friends, who was like, oh yeah, he totally cured my dad's gout or some something. And he's like, okay. So he went to, to see this. It sounds so stupid. My dad, by the way, was educated at Beida University, the Harvard of China. My mom mm -hmm. went to Tsinghua, the Yale of China, like both of them super intelligent people. And he's seen so much of the world. Like, what are you doing? Right? He went to go see this dumbass living Buddha in his mountain retreat. By the way, not something you should do when you have cancer. Uh, <laughs> and 
spent days there eating like nothing but eggs or or whatever and then and then at one point he like laid down on the table and the huofu spat uh, holy water onto his back uh, to cover his moles which represented the sins of his father and he saw the moles move and was like hey uh, Feng Wei, my dad, like, I saw the moles move, which means that you'll be cured sooner, you know, like, like, right to you and me. What? Like, is, yeah. is that even a thing? Fine, whatever, you want to go and waste away your, your healthy years not getting chemo, that's fine. But, <clears throat> then he turns around and is like, I need you to wire me 100,000 US dollars. Now. And it's like, my mom's like, well, why? And it's, well, he's going to take the 100,000 US and uh, uh, use that to support himself. And he needs me to do that because I'm a dakwar, a big official who has a lot of money and a lot of his clients are poor. Then he's going to release some turtles and that'll give me good karma. And that's going to help with my cancer. Mm -hmm. did, 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 did he get the money? Yeah, I well, I, like I'm Holy very privileged. Holy shit, that's like that, a huge con, right? Because here's the thing: like my dad's worked very hard his whole life, and my mom has worked very hard her whole life to save up this money, right? Like I'm very privileged that I don't have to worry about finances usually. But who has a hundred thousand U.S. dollars to just throw away like that? And he, I, I, I just like he turned into a totally different person, which is part of why it shook me, right? It's like. I mean, he obviously had this within him the whole time. I just didn't know it. And he was like, if you don't give me, don't you love me? Right? If you don't so give me 100,000, right? 100K right now, you obviously don't love me. And my mom's like, you're, you're a crazy person, right? But she had been so battered down over the years by his abuse. And also, you never want to be like, I don't know. It's very, it's very also very hard to understand why my mom did the things that she did, but I was not in that position, right? But like, she was like, I don't want to be that person that it's like, hey, would you rather have 100K or your husband's life, right? Maybe, maybe this yeah. will work. Is it like, how much is a life worth? Like 100K? And then he asked for another 10K. And then he asked for another 10K. And ah, oh, man, it just like, um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it really changed the way that I look, not just at my dad, but in but people in general that you can think that you know somebody, but you never really know them until it gets to that point, right? My parents, the people who are arguably the closest to me and have, I've known the, for the longest could be, could change just like that. And I always really admired my dad, even though we didn't have a great relationship for his intelligence and his, um, you know, ability, his social ability and that kind of thing. And to, to just have it all thrown in my face that he could do something like that to his own family uh, was really, was really, really sad and definitely catapulted me into, into some very poor life choices that I made. Um, but I think, you know, again, like if you take, this is actually why I love your, your show. It's like, if you take a deep enough dive into anybody's life, you'll find, you'll kind of like unearth these little nuggets of like, oh, that's really interesting. Like people, people go through this, right? And on the surface, so somebody like me, who's, you know, I have two arms, two legs, uh, 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 a, f a whole nuclear family, right? And there's a lot of stuff that other people can't claim, but you know, under the surface, Everybody has their struggles. Everybody, you know, goes through really tough times and that changed them fundamentally. Yeah, so did your dad ever go back and get the, the, the radiation and chemotherapy? Yeah. So, oh my God, I just, I want to tell you these things because I feel like I don't have, you know, this is not something that we, people generally talk about, yeah. but this is like, this is real shit that happened. He... <laughs> So after the 100K and the 10K, the releasing the turtles and preventing my grandma from committing suicide, like what, what like give me 10K and I'll prevent your mother from killing herself because I saw it in the future. Okay. He, he was like, get rid of, throw away every pointy object in the house, swords, scissors, knives, because that will help me heal. Oh my gosh. And then us going through the house and then taking all these dumbass knives and it's toss it in the nearest river. Motherfucker, I live in Colorado. There's like no water anywhere. We trekked to um, a, a sewer, like a, a storm drain. Trekked to a storm drain. Tossed the fucking knives in the storm. Like, what am I even like? And then, and then, of course, though, I think at a certain point, like this, this went on for quite some time. It's very, very hard. Uh, but after a certain time, I think he kind of was like, you know, 
maybe I'm done enough with this crazy shit. And he came back to the States, started getting the chemo. And that's when I came back, took care of my sister. They went to Arkansas and uh, he's in remission now. <laughs> but since he's it's a very terminal lucky illness, then. like he's he is very, very lucky. How long, how long did that go on? Like how long was he putting off going to get uh, oh. the chemo? Um, was it a year? Yeah, it was about a year. Like, like again, all very fuzzy, partly because of yeah. the depression, partly because of the drinking, partly a lot of shit going on. But I think, yeah, it must have been like a year or so. He was very lucky. Also, he he has the advantage of being younger than most people who get uh, diagnosed. He's uh, 50. He's in his late 50s now. Um, so so a lot of things were going f for him. Um, yeah. And also my mom, who's unwavering in her support even after so much abuse and then went oh my gosh and then when she was taking care of him in arkansas like being a caretaker is already, already difficult enough right yeah. your, your, your life whole life revolves around this other person uh, and catering to their every whim basically and for my dad that's just like i know he was suffering like every my mom was always like you never know how much suffering you go through when you have cancer you go through chemo yeah. i'm like yeah but i probably wouldn't be so shitty to the one person who's basically keeping me alive on this earth <laughs> She dealt with so much abuse, um, but came out in the end. I think everybody kind of changed. Like my mom definitely changed before she was somebody who was very quick to anger. I mean, she's still very quick to anger, <laughs> um, but she w was not very tolerant either of anything. And I think she 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 had kind of a shift in mentality after that. I definitely had a shift in mentality. Yo, life is fucking short, man. Um, but but also it kind of unearthed a lot of demons. And then I'm lucky that it didn't hit me when I was like 60 or something and maybe incapable yeah. of change at that point. I, I went through like a, a, a weird upheaval when I was just in college. And so uh, hopefully I exercised all those <laughs> exercised all those demons, did enough drinking for my whole life, a lot of other questionable things. So hopefully we're, we're in the clear there, but it, it really was a process. So. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of go back to your life growing up. I mean, one of the things mm -hmm. you had mentioned, and I kind of want to look at, it, is that you were so used to moving around that you were—it was something that you were kind of like bragged about. Did that cause you not to really get close to anyone? Because I can't imagine that you would ever want to get close to anyone. If what's the point of getting close to someone if I'm just going to leave them here very quickly? Yeah, uh, I was. I think. I think when I when I grew older, that was a, a much bigger issue. When I was like, when I was five, fucking everybody's my friend, right? <laughs> and I remember, oh man, I remember when I was a, uh, I was in third grade. I had just moved to Texas, and I walked up to like the first girl that I saw. She had glasses just like me. I'm blind as a bat, by the way. I, I like very major astigmatism, horrible nearsightedness. And she had glasses just like me. And um, and so I walked up to her and I was like, hi, what do you want to be my friend? I remember it super clearly because then I used it again when I was in fifth grade when we moved again. <laughs> so, um, and, and then she was like, yeah, you know, and then we became friends. But I, I definitely felt just the lack of connection um, when I was in middle school. When I was in sixth grade, moved back to Colorado from Texas. And not only was there a major cultural shift in terms of uh, uh, the wealthy tech suburb that we lived in in Texas, where everybody in my class was Indian or Chinese except three white kids, right? And all their parents are working in, with computers and being programmers and engineers. And then I came back to Colorado Springs, which is much more white, just, it's just how it is. Um, and like, the immediate like disconnect with my peers was really obvious. I remember one person being like, hey, hey, you use chapsticks. And like, like who even says that? Right. But that was something like, I never heard that because everybody was Chinese around me. Um, and, and so it was very tough to make friends for seventh grade. I was homeschooled. Uh, sixth grade was when my dad went back to China. So a family upheaval. And then uh, in seventh grade, I was homeschooled, which was awful. I totally infected the computer, home computer with tons of porn <laughs> by accident, <laughs> Russian porn. Uh, Cause it was like a, it was like a K through 12. They send you, um, they send you these packets with like CDs yeah. and textbooks and you work through them at home. And, and like, I accidentally like, like opened up a porn site at, at one point or something, you know, the click Acc the, the accidentally. Of pop -up ads. accidentally. Well, okay. The first time was an accident, but then later, not an accident. <laughs> I was a, I was an awful kid. I was like, other people don't think porn is icky, but I don't. And so I just like look through all this super disgusting porn at, you know, um, and, 
<laughs> and I remember sneaking to the computer like super late at night at like three o'clock in the morning, but it was in the living room. So I had to be super quiet. Oh. And, we also, and, and like, tr- like looking up random shit and like reading dirty fan fiction and like, and anyways, the, it was a strange time. I had no friends. Um, eighth grade went to a different school, uh, got re- re-enrolled in public school. Um, and in eighth grade, right, you're like at the cusp of going into high school. So everybody has been together for three years, yeah. basically, except me. Um, I also wasn't in the uh, gifted and talented program because they don't allow you to get into the di- gifted and talented program like so late. Yeah. Um, and I had always been in the gifted and talented program. Like this is like such privileged like little shit asian kid type of thing like hey, i'm not even the gifted talented program what you think i'm not gifted uh, <laughs> but um but i only bring it up because again just like the kind of people the my classmates who i was around who i was used to being around not the same so kids who came from single parent homes or um i remember there was a girl who who had a who was a foster child and she had a pretty rough background and had her eye scratched out by one of her foster parents cats so she had a glass eye and it never moved so um you know kids who listen to corn rather than shostakovich and didn't know all the piano pieces in the suzuki method or shit like that and it like people who live totally normal lives but to me was as if i dropped down on an alien planet and and so very very hard to make friends i remember i was a super awkward kid i didn't like to shower either so it smelled probably really bad (laughs) um and and i was still hyper focused on school and a lot of my classmates weren't and so that like created a divide as well and then when i headed into high school it was just very very odd i honestly did i why didn't i make friends it's a good question i mean certainly home situation didn't really help i never brought a friend i never brought a friend home i remember thinking about it when i was in college later that i never i never had a party at my house i never celebrated my birthday um i never like had a movie night um nothing like that um so i I don't know why and it wasn't as though when i when i got into high school again i was in the ib program um which is similar to ap uh and so it wasn't as though we weren't on the same wavelength necessarily i just had a really really hard time connecting and i also was going oh i was also going through a super super butch phase like when my I started in sixth grade, actually. I remember telling my mom, like, just buy me these cargo pants she didn't want to. And I was like, it's just a phase. I'll only, it, like, you won't have to buy me these cargo pants forever. I just want them now. And it, it did turn out to be a phase. I look much better with long hair. I kind of have, like, a fat face, so the short hair didn't work out so well. Um, but, yeah, so, like, I was going through a super butch phase. I also still hated showering. Um <clears throat> <laughs> and so smelled bad not super hot like I, I don't know and you know had a hard time making friends like a weird whack-ass kid um and uh and and so it kind of i was kind of just like a drifter and then i got to college still a drifter i, I don't know i, I, let's, I let's let's back up a like, second yeah. before we hit college um did that did you ever think to yourself why am i not making friends or was it mostly just you were running through the regiment that is your your life and what your parents kind of put on you good question um i don't know i think maybe just all during that time i was like super numb i think would would be how i would say how i I would describe it like like it wasn't it just wasn't something that was on my radar, I suppose. Cause like before, like when I was in third grade and stuff and like a normal kid, um, I would be like, do you want to be my friend? But that thought never really crossed my mind when I was older. Like it was, I, I, I remember there was like a really interesting dichotomy where I at once didn't really connect with most of my peers but I didn't want to go home. I never wanted to go home. I always wanted to do more after school activities so I wouldn't have to go home. Um, And obviously family situation, but I suppose it never really, like I had acquaintances, like it's not as though I talked to nobody or anything, you know, like um, I I still talk to people. I was in the marching band actually, which is where most of my, um, like my, my casual friends were from, but I, I don't know. I, and it's definitely held over to today where I'm very, uh, I have a hard time <laughs> making that connection, which, which seems ironic because uh, I'm in, I'm in such a, I'm in a very performative career. Um, but there is always that kind of like, 
the the maybe it's the Chinese mians. There's like the public me, and then there's the real me, right? And it, it's so with anybody who's who's an entertainer. But getting to the private me has always been really difficult, and uh, and it's gotten is like hampered my 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 ability to make connections with people has really impacted me now that I'm an adult uh, and need to do that uh, but I, I I don't know I think it's um I think back then it was a sense of vulnerability right and it still is now it's like I don't want people to see how horrible everything is right yeah. just internally you feel like you have something to be ashamed of or something to hide and so it's like how do I get through this performance, basically. Like, how do I get to school, perform, like, academically, socially, do my activities, and come home, and then I get to shrink down into myself and finally relax and just be away from the world and <laughs> play play Oblivion. That, like, video games are definitely a, an escape outlet for yeah. me where I can finally just, like, relax and not have to, and, like, to, to hide away from the world for just a little while. Um, so I guess not having friends never really bothered me in in that moment because I wasn't in a place where I could really give of myself to other people. Was emotion something that ever improved being able to be talked about? Or is that something to this day is still really hard with your family to talk about emotions? It's still that that uh, that front face that you have to maintain. Because I have even like noticing it now, like there's moments where, I, where I'm watching you and I'm like, she's definitely feeling emotions right now, but she's still mm -hmm. smiling. And she's still yeah, yeah, like part yeah. of her is that like I can see it like when I when I'm watching you and I'm like she's feeling things right now but she still puts out that face of I need to smile in front of everyone. Mm -hmm. It is. I I don't know why that is like right because like hmm. <laughs> yeah because like yo this is honestly like actually really tough because yeah. I don't talk about this is not something that you talk about very often and I'm actually a really easy crier so if I do like if you cry it's okay like like start crying but um but yeah I I suppose it's it's like something that's just always been impressed on me is that like doing your job being strong is good not doing your job, being weak, needing, you know, stuff like medicine, uh, you know, not necessarily hugs, but like other people to tell you it's okay and blah is bad, right? Strength is good, vulnerability is bad. And it's not necessarily that my parents said this like with their words, but that's how they always acted, right? Yeah. That it doesn't matter what's going on, you're gonna make it through, right? Because in China, if you didn't, then you just starved. Right. Like that's, that's literally like a life and death choice for especially my mom. My dad actually had a pretty comfortable uh, upbringing, but um, my mom was very much so. My One of my uncles was actually crushed by uh, a rolling wagon of bricks and he didn't die right away. Uh, he So they were they had a tractor hooked up to a wagon full of bricks and he was standing on the junction and the tractor they're like holding, you know, to ride the tractor um, into the field. <clears throat> And he fell off the junction and the wagon of bricks just oh. crushed him. Um, but he didn't die right away. Uh, but nobody had any medicine. Even if they had medicine, nobody had any money. Nobody had any transportation to get him to a center of any kind. And so she, they just, he just died, um, <laughs> uh, which must have been really awful. And my mom talks about him a lot, but like never like with sadness. And, and so I guess it was just like, because for my parents, it's very much like, I like physics, but I'm not going to get a job with physics. I'm going to do electrical engineering, right? So like for, they just expected the same from me and my sister because they did that themselves. And I honestly think it's like a great sign of strength that they were able to do that. I always, always like look back on myself because like I'm on antidepressants to help me get through the day and everything. And, and it's like, am I, am I not as great as them? Because I need like this kind of, medical intervention in order to like be as productive as they were even struggling through the same things and i don't know i i really wonder because i see that we're very similar in a lot of ways but for whatever reason i just don't have the same ability to muscle through not sure so you have, you mentioned your sister. Do you have any other uh, brothers or sisters besides your sister? Just one. Thank God. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I have a younger sister. Yeah. Okay. How much younger is she than you? She is three years younger. 
Okay. So what was it like being with her in this situation? What was your, both of your guys' dynamic kind of going through this entire thing? Um, if you need a minute too, we can take a minute. It's not a big deal. <laughs> no, I'm totally fine. I just need to like, I also, my nose also runs super easily. So my tears okay. are all turning into boogers. You should always have a roll of toilet paper at your studio. Um, <clears throat> so I actually don't know. It's like, I, I keep like, you keep asking all these really great questions and uh, like, I, I don't know, kind of because it was like a blur, really yeah. just a blur. Um, I, she was very much more shielded from it than I was though, because um, younger, right. And yeah. always, always the baby of the family is going to have like, you know, be, be a little bit more coddled. And, um, and I, because, that added to the fact that I'm a where I'm a first generation American, so my parents had no idea what applying to college was. <laughs> so I remember, like, I'm actually surprised I did as well as I did because literally they basically just asked me to raise myself when I was a teen. So because my mom was very very much focused on taking care of my sister, so during high school and stuff, she would be like, "Don't forget to like do your college application," and then she's like, "All the other kids are doing it. You're already behind," and so I just go down and like open my laptop and college applications uh comma app f e and <laughs> like it like right and, and i just literally just just figured out most of most of all of that on my own and i i, uh, I would like fly to um again like that kind of like dichotomy right so we had the money to fly me to say the northeast and check out a bunch of schools. I just flew there by myself and just like hung out for, for a little while. And then um, <clears throat> flew to California, hung out for a little while. I remember I had a, a small rolling suitcase and I just like landed there, figured out how to get onto the BART to get to Berkeley. I had my rolling suitcase. I was just rolling it the whole time. And then I got to the school and I was like, oh, I still have, I, I was like, yay, I'm like early for the campus tour. Cause I had like, done like it's like the diagram with all the strings attached and everything and like yeah. oh if okay then i finish the tour and they get on another train and i can make it to like this other college in time da, 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 da. and um and i had this stupid bag uh this stupid rolling bag and i asked if i could like hold it in the uh, visitor center and they're like no because bombs and 9 11 and fuck okay but you know like and so i was like okay and they're like i was like is there anywhere else i can put it and they're like no i was like all right then. So I just rolled it all throughout the Berkeley campus. I just had this stupid bag with me the, the, basically the, the whole time because I nobody was with me. I was just by myself. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my parents basically asked me to be very independent and just figure out my life on my own because they weren't capable of really helping, uh, you know, just with experience or anything like that. And also going through a lot of, um, you know, emotional difficulties and dealing with my dad's shit and stuff. So uh, I... I essentially just did it all on my own. Um, and because of that, I kind of lost connection with my sister for a little while, um, all through high school and, and stuff. And we only really started reconnecting after college. So we had, kind of had a big break there where I didn't really know what was going on with her. She didn't really know what was going on with me. Um, but now that we're out of that and adults, <laughs> um, we've rekindled the relationship and it's actually been really good. Like she's, I consider her to be my best friend um, and truly somebody that I can rely on in any instance and talk about any issue and we're going to come out all right, which is not something I can say for literally anybody else. So, mm -hmm. so kind of looking at, you're finishing up high school, you, you've been struggling a lot with this. What what are you thinking about for college? Because obviously it's a requirement, right? Like it's not even a, it's not even a choice. It's basically a, you're going to college, right? That's just where you're going to college. Um, mm -hmm. What did you decide to pick, and what did you decide to major in? Because I've heard so, I've heard three different degrees so far that you you've been like through different interviews you've done. You you mentioned biology, and then you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, pre med, which I'm assuming is still biology. But then you yeah. also uh, sociology is in there too. Mm -hmm. that I have seen. So, uh, at least on your LinkedIn, just an FYI, you might want to yep, use yep. this. Uh, so what are you thinking about when you're going into college? So when I was going to college, um, I was like, I'm going to med school. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> not just because my parents, I always, again, I had like such a fucking superiority complex. I was like, I don't want to do pre-med just because my parents told me is because I'm actually interested, not like you plebs. Uh, <laughs> um, but that is true. I've always been extremely interested in medicine and I'm actually um, <clears throat> heading back to EMT school in August. So 
Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I worked as a, uh, I, I got my EMT degree uh, when I was taking care of my sister. So mm -hmm. in, the, in the break in early college. And then I also worked as a CPR instructor for quite a while. So I also worked in the emergency department as a scribe for a long time. So I, this is a genuine interest of mine. However, in order to go to medical school in the United States, it's extremely competitive. And there are obviously options, but um, because of my non-traditional route, uh, I actually I actually haven't graduated yet. So <clears throat> who knows? It's all up in the air. Maybe I could get all three degrees. Uh, but yeah, so I, I started out with biology because that's the most natural path forward. And I had obviously yeah. a ton of interest in it. Um, but I like failed a shit ton of classes my first year. That's when I started drinking. Um, and so <clears throat> I just remember like sitting on the couch and being like, I have a math final right now. Does it even matter if I go? Like, what if I just didn't, right? Which had never been something that crossed my mind before, but I was like, what if I just didn't? And then I didn't. And then obviously I failed the class. So, um, <clears throat> so your first year of college, did you go through basically like a huge rebellion phase where you were like, I don't care about any structure and I'm going to have no structure now? Uh, not a hundred percent. It it was it wasn't it almost. It didn't feel like a conscious decision at the time. Um, <laughs> stay in school, kids. Don't drink too much because uh, two things happened. So one, I like moved across the country, which is for me. I'm used to it and not a big upheaval. But I was uh, still, you know, a, a very new place, which is uh, Berkeley, and I also joined the marching band. And that the cow band, man, we play hard. We work hard, but we also play hard. And so I had never had any alcohol before in my life. And <clears throat> for me, I was, I have an addictive personality, which I found out later. Um, but, um, but like drinking was such an easy escape from everything that I was feeling and uh, trying to deal with that. It was, it wasn't even a, like a decision. I remember it like got so bad. Um, I remember at one point I like snuck downstairs to the the kitchen area and there was like half a half of like 30 rack or something and i like stole two beers i felt so bad that later i went and like put like five dollars on the thing <laughs> but like i was like desperately trying to find ways so that i could feel better because my current situation felt inescapable and so when i was like sitting on the couch like being like do i even go to this math final it just it wasn't necessarily like i want i don't care if i fail this class it's like i don't i don't care about anything like what even is the point of anything, right? And I remember I blacked out for the first time that year, and I like went into a weird, uh, like my my um, later ex was like, yeah, you like were crying hysterically, and I punched a mirror and broke it, and um, and then I I was like in the kitchen and I threw I, like picked up a glass and threw it and the, like broke, and then I like went back to my room and and like cut myself and then threw up in the trash can and passed out <laughs> like that was like that was like rinse and repeat Ooh. um i didn't black out every time but like it was it was a very 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 dark place so and i have to ask because like this is like a this dark place even like you still being in high school didn't seem this dark how did it mm -hmm. get from being in high school to being somewhat still passable to this like enormously dark and almost morbid place uh while I was in high school, just kind of dealing with my dad's general abuse. And then when I got to college, my freshman year is when he got diagnosed with cancer. Okay. And that was, I think, a really, a really big part of it. Um, at the time, I was like, everybody gets cancer. Like, does it even matter? Um, also, I hate my dad. Blah. Like, I don't even care if he dies. He's so horrible. Um, obviously, though, you can't just sever that connection with your parents. Mm -hmm. You still love them. So I think that was really tough for me. And just, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it was that like flipped the switch, but I think it, it, uh, part of it was like the, just like the family things that I was dealing with and also the availability and freedom that I yeah. finally had. Cause like, even if I wanted to be a blackout drunk at home, like my mom would just come in there and like beat me until I was like <laughs> unconscious. I remember one time I was sleeping in, I hated getting up because I hated facing the day. Right. It's like a classic sign of depression, but I didn't know at the it time. Is. I hated getting up. I just didn't want to like face my mom and, you know, in high school and she took a pan and threw it at me and it like dented the wall. And 
<clears throat> and like I still didn't want to get up. Or, like why? Just wouldn't you just get up at that point? So she like took my skates and like like I had some rollerblades and then like threw those at me and everything. And it was it was like not a not a great home life. But um, but I didn't have any space, so I was just like like shrinking yeah. around, like doing whatever I could to just get through the day. And then when I got to college, it's like well nobody is throwing pants at you, and um and also nobody cares like. You could show up to class, doesn't matter, right? Also, Berkeley is a massive campus. I was a tour guide there for a long time. 36,000 total students. Wow. Um, nobody cares. Uh, and it, I mean, it's like the real world, right? It's like nobody cares. Nobody knows if you go to class. Nobody knows if you're uh, drinking. Nobody knows if you're doing your homework. Nobody knows if you're dead, right? And so kind of like that realization, right, coming down plus like the, the you know brush with death that my dad is having and and all this freedom and like I could feel better right now if I just like got wasted right and I was part of a group where it was not just socially acceptable but encouraged. strongly encouraged to be a heavy drinker um, and that has that culture has actually changed quite a bit uh, with Cal band so people are becoming much less douchey frat people which is great I think it's it's good like People still get wild and crazy, but like it's it's not like you have to do this. Um, and I had always considered myself somebody immune to such social pressures that like you know plague the rest of you peasants. So I I didn't work hard to fight against it. Um, and I think all of that combined just like yo I was a mess, dude. And then oh my gosh, I mean, like I I'm actually I think something that's really interesting in esports in particular is that a lot of people with like kind of more rougher backgrounds or just didn't have necessarily the traditional uh, happy home uh, type find themselves in esports. I mean, Brands yeah. actually talked quite a bit about you know his struggles and stuff. And I think it's really important for people to see that you can overcome that kind of thing because at least for me that was never even something that was on my radar it's like if you didn't go to college right away after high school and graduate after four years then you're a failure obviously you're never going to make anything of yourself and well it's still up in the air whether or not i make anything of myself um uh you know it's it's not the end of the world you can still come out maintain healthy relationships uh get get your shit done make money um you know still drink if you want to do whatever and it's not the end of the world but um but yeah, it was like, it was rough. So uh, hopefully, if anybody's listening, hey, you still got a career in esports. But um, uh, then my second year, well, well, I took a break to go home and take care of my sister. And then when I came back and and was truly on my own, I, I don't know, man, I actually, I actually don't know what led me down such a dark path. But I think it had a lot to do with how I've... Uh, value myself as a person yeah. and i was actually really interested to talk about this uh specifically because in in esports when you're an entertainer right uh, it's very different from say if you're uh, a limo driver right yeah. so say you're driving the limo and you hit every pothole and you're terrible at parking and you're always late or whatever and people say oh you're a shitty limo driver right but you could still see value in yourself as a person yeah well you know i i still rock at poker and i got like a banging hot girlfriend or you know whatever um <clears throat> and i'm awesome and funny but mm -hmm. when you're work in entertainment right so if people if you go out there and you know broadcast yourself and put yourself up for other people's scrutiny and they're like i hate that person oh my god i can't even believe that she's like you know casting this like i hope she dies right or like i have never seen such a garbage person on camera before blah 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 then it's not just like oh you're bad at your job it's like you're bad right you start associating everything that people say about you with your actual value as a person, which is something that I don't think holds over quite as much in other professions and is something very unique to what we do, right? Content creators as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I think a large part of my struggle was because I had failed so spectacularly academically, that was how I saw my value, right? And if I'm not good at that, what even am I? What's even the point? And obviously, had a drinking problem so that made the academic side of things even yeah. harder and it's a negative feedback loop right it just gets worse and worse and worse and um i i like i, I remember at, at points i i literally just like couldn't get out of bed all i would do all i would do is like get out of bed and uh there was a corner store uh, several blocks uh down off of campus and they had bottles of wine for five dollars each 
And Trader Joe's was cheaper, but then you had to go to Trader Joe's. <laughs> so I would like take ten dollars and like walk down there and get two bottles of wine and like with the little bit of consciousness that I had, like walk back home and then just spend the rest of the day drinking myself into oblivion. Right. Man. Or like That's pretty bad. Like it's it was bad. I I also like and and the worst the part that I feel the worst about though is not like what I did to myself, obviously, you know maybe damaged my body and obviously didn't, didn't help my school or anything. I wasted my parents' money. But I, I was just like, I had like the people that I was closest to, like my casual friends, um, like I was not good to them. When you're, when you're in that hole, right, it becomes so hard to look, like you can't even take care of yourself. How can you maintain relationships and treat the people that are around you that you care about with, with you know, any kind of kindness or, um, Right. And I, th I think that's the part that I feel most badly about, because like all the people that I like ignored or flicked out on or or was like straight up horrible to it, they're they're good people. I just like couldn't spare the emotional bandwidth to give them the, you know, the respect or the time or whatever that they deserved. And, you know, I, I was functional. Sure. I was I was definitely functional. There were moments where I was really functional. I would try and like cultivate something but it always ended up just like f falling apart because of how just how everything was and I think that was kind of like the biggest shame right is that I wasted so much time that not only could I have been improving myself but I, I was could have had some great relationships with some people who were around me and I kind of just threw it all away right and it got to the point where I was just like I remember I, I don't remember, like, I remember, like, just being so down that I was, I, I also started cutting, which is ask, I was going to ask you if, if yeah. any sort of cutting kind of came up or any suicide, it progressed mm -hmm. to that. It did. It, it, it definitely did. And, like, I mean, I don't have, like, super, super obvious scars because I'm also, like, kind of a baby. <laughs> but, like, yeah, I would totally cut. And when you start cutting, that's when you know, like, that's when you know you got you to gotta change something because the next step is you start you you make an attempt on your life which i did twice um and again like i live or die it doesn't really matter but the stress that i put my friends through right because i lived in a massive house with a ton of people and i was actually fairly close to some of them um it was just like right like you can like i can't imagine what it'd be like if say like boop had an attempt made an attempt on his life or something like that right yeah. and and so to like do that to other people is again what i what I feel most badly about. And it's just, uh, you, you never want to go there, man. Cause the hard part is nobody can talk you out of it. Right. Nobody. It's, it's something that you have to come around to internally, which is what makes it so hard. And what makes like, you know, people who, who answer like suicide hotlines or anything like that, like, yo, you're just asking for abuse, emotional abuse, because if that person really, really wants to do it, there's nothing you can do. Right. And Fortunately, I was just a chicken. Uh, and also, like, I remember, oh, my gosh, I was, like, I, I, like, went up to my friend's room, and I was wasted. I was, like, browning out, like, in and out. And, and I remember, like, trying to lift. He was on, like, the third floor. I was trying to, like, raise the window so I could, like, dive out of it, which is dumb. Um, but I, like, meant it. I, like, meant it at that moment. And and like he was so calm and like tried to like talk me down obviously i still wanted to because you can't it's, it's so hard to talk somebody down um <laughs> but through the combination of a shitty ass building this was like the slum situation that i was talking about the shitty ass building and the window wouldn't open because it was stuck and my weak ass noodle arms which had no muscular definition from drinking all the goddamn time i couldn't open the window and and then eventually i just got so tired i fell asleep <laughs> okay was that the first time or the second uh, time that was the second time. Um, the first time I attempted to slit my wrist with this big ass kitchen knife that I had. Oh. And my friend, oh my God. And, and see, this is a hard part because he also came from a rough upbringing. Um, not a great time, a lot of abuse going around and, and like real, real abuse for, for him. Like his, bro his brother's like fucking crazy and would like actually chase him around with like a, a butcher knife and try to like see if he could like hit him with it. Anyways, and so he's dealt with alcoholism in his family. He's dealt with uh, suicidal ideation in his family before. And, and I was like, and, and like, I can't believe I just did this. I was like, oh, I'm going to like kill myself. Right. And he was like, don't. <laughs> 
obviously and um and he like climbed in through my window because he's like a really tall dude and like physically like ripped the knife out of my hand and like gathered up all of my knives because I, I cooked a lot and um and like my bottles and everything I just remember him like standing there screaming in like rage at me because how could you do this to me right like after all the talks that we've had and everything and blah and that you could like like basically like open up all of his trauma again and um and that was that like made me super sad i was like i was like oh my gosh uh, you know because again me i obviously didn't value my life at that time but i still had you know i wasn't like the peak of selfishness where i didn't care about other people right and that kind of like definitely gave me a moment where i was like maybe it's time to maybe it's time to reevaluate things but then again you know like substance abuse and depression and like suicide and stuff just demons made for each other because every time that like maybe i started feeling better about myself something would like make me not feel good about myself obviously and and then i would drink again and then when you drink you start everything all over again. you start everything all over again and it was just a terrible cycle i had to just like like i had to quit like cold turkey it was awful i i just like one day, uh, basically, my mom was like, if you don't quit drinking, you're going to kill yourself. You just have to stop. And I was like, oh, but, you know, what if I just, like, only drank when I was around friends and, and stuff? I tried that for a while. It, Nope. You got it. You just cannot. No, no more. Right? Not to say that you can never, ever drink again. Some people, you can never touch or drop again. Right? You can't even have, like, vanilla extract in your house. Some people, you can, again, with moderation. But, like getting to that point where you're okay again to just be around it, it's a very long process. And I remember one day I was just like sitting there and I had like, and I forgot, I don't know if there was like necessarily like a light bulb moment, but I was in a different apartment. Like this was all through my college years, like, mm -hmm. and definitely a big reason why I still haven't graduated is just because like, you know, you're not doing anything. Um, I remember I had mixed uh like a a, a a cucumber gimlet i was like fancy drunk um <laughs> i had mixed a cucumber gimlet and i only remembered like mixing it i hadn't remembered like drinking it and everything which up like to that point was like something that just happens to me right i just like accepted it which is awful but i remember just like I, I had like come out of it i was obviously super wasted and i had like thrown up all over the floor and just like like I remember just like waking up and like there was like so, like a ton of vomit everywhere and I uh, taking some paper towels and like scooping the vomit and like and then there was like a moment where I was like is this just what it's gonna be like now like like waking up and seeing the wreckage of your life around you and then because like cleaning vomit by the way, is not something people should do, just get used to and just do all the time. But that had like, right? It's disgusting. I had it's also very eaten disgusting. curry. I had eaten curry. It was curry oh. vomit. <laughs> oh. Right? It was curry oh. scented vomit that took forever. I had to pour baking soda and all that shit. Like, like, I, and I, there was like this zen, like, like, like just feeling it. And then I was like, that's not normal. Like, don't, why? like that doesn't have to be how it is like why is this so the next day or maybe the next day i don't remember <laughs> um i went to the store and i bought like a huge box of instant coffee because i had you know heard that people who are trying to break addictions can can like kind of lean a little bit on caffeine um and i just drank coffee all day long every time i wanted to drink one, I had to get up from my chair and I was like weak as fuck. Uh, so I would just like get up. I, I would just, instead I would get up and turn around and like put my kettle on and make a cup of coffee. And I remember complaining to my sister because this is the time where we started talking more. Um, I remember complaining to my sister, oh, my stomach hurts all the time. And she's like, quit drinking coffee. I'm like, no, I need, I need like the, the stimulation, the, the, the psychoactive stimulation from the caffeine to, to keep me like in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And if your stomach hurts all the time, you don't want to drink, right? It was just awful. I remember just like going through so much coffee, just constantly day in, day out. I got really dehydrated too, because I should have drank more water, but like, just like day in, day out. And then eventually I broke it. I did it. You can do it too. <laughs> it's so I, so it's I, I not all hopeless. Yeah. I don't know if you know this. I actually used to work at a drug rehab center. 
uh, for a while. What? Yeah, yeah. Oh I my actually, gosh. So I actually come from a health background because I have a four-year psych degree, but I also worked with a counseling firm that did a lot of, uh, we actually did a lot of uh, contract work with the uh, rehab center. I've primarily worked with drug addiction, uh, which oh, I draw yeah. a lot of parallels between drug addiction and esports, actually. But whether people like it or not, there's a lot of similarities with people who are uh-huh. in esports, okay? And like behavior patterns that they have. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I was going to kind of look for is were you, were you drinking so much where you actually went through physical withdrawals or were you able to avoid that? I was able to avoid that. Thank right. God. Cause like yeah, cause going you through, can die. Yeah. Alcohol I was going to say al- alcohol is one of the few things. If you try to quit cold Turkey, if you actually have a physical addiction that you can actually die from. So. Yeah. Right. Like I've, I, I was like going through the DTs by yourself. It's not only like one of the scariest things ever, but you can literally like, just like, yeah, like, die from it yeah no i was lucky i was actually bizarrely functional in my moments of lucidity right mm-hmm. and and i would be like just like go about my day and if you didn't know i was like a wreck you you might not know that i i was a wreck because like a lot as, this is something else that like as, um if people just aren't as exposed to addiction you think like you think about like oh who's somebody that's addicted to drug oh you think about like the tweaker that's like on the street or whatever but there are a lot of highly functional addicts and i was one of them so so kind of looking at uh where you were coming from you obviously went through this really bad depression really bad drinking problem um Mm -hmm. some suicidal attempts that kind of occurred um what was the moment that was there a moment where you were like, this is this is the way that I'm going to start to break out of it? You mentioned that you use instant coffee to kind of help break the drinking. Um, coffee right here? Yeah. Uh-huh. Coffee, coffee is, caffeine is love or life. Um, I love caffeine too much. Uh, did you do anything else? Like obviously a lot of those kind of background problems there don't go away, right? Like right, all these right. issues that you're having. Mm-hmm. How did you start to handle those? Huh. Um, well... Well, for one, my dad going to remission definitely helped. Uh, he stopped getting all the, the the crazy voodoo shit ideas out of his head. Well, for the most part, this is actually <laughs> this is actually one of my my biggest fears is you know it's gonna come back. And yeah. What happens the next time? Um, but uh, that that definitely did help. There were some some changes. I also um, this isn't so so I. I, I I came back home and I think a big part of, uh, I mean, you would know as a, as a mental health professional, um, is, is that environment is a big part of the recovery process. And, um, and so I was lucky enough, again, this is, I've just gotten so lucky all through my life. And, um, and cause I could have been born a peasant. I could have four kids right now. Um, and and potentially still addicted to alcohol, but yeah, so, um, I, I was lucky enough that my mom was like, come back home. She was always just willing to drop everything and tell me to come back home. And I, I was the one who didn't want to because I thought I could just like do it by myself. And mm-hmm. maybe I could have, but it, it definitely sped up the process to be able to rely on like the family and even um, uh, even just like three squares a day, right? And having like not needing to worry about money for rent, right? Uh, having a, a shower readily available, clean clothes, th- those kinds of things all all really help because that means less less burden on you so you can try and focus inward and 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 deal with deal with your demons um and so i was able to come back home and uh and almost and coinciding with that was me picking up overwatch so i had started um so i had started following overwatch back when i was still uh in california and um and it was, I mean, it's so funny that you bring up like uh, esports and addiction and kind of the same behavior patterns because that was like absolutely it for me, right? I don't like, think the that's thing a bad is, thing. Right. I, will, I want to clarify because everyone is like, oh yeah. my God, why are you saying that esports people are like drug guys? I don't think that, okay? Like, no, right. There's similarities that does not mean they're exactly the same. They are, they are absolutely not the same. One of them is way, way healthier. Um, yeah. But it, it really was just like that, that for me for a really long time where like I would wake up because, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to get a first drink, but it's because the game is on, right? Yeah. And this gives me a purpose to like look forward to something, and 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 it, uh, you know, engages me for for that amount of time, and I can you know look forward to this regularly every single day, and you know, um, it occupies my me mentally, and and so on and so forth. Um, so so that was what Overwatch became for me. Uh, and when I went home, I started looking more into the casting aspects, and it was completely serendipitous that I happened to meet Left Guy, who is still Oh my God, bless his heart. It's still one of the just 
kindest and most amazing people. I eternally grateful for what he helped spark uh, with me. Um, and he was after after going for a very very long time with people with very little encouragement. Nobody yeah. ever said like, "Hey, yeah, you could totally do it." Because um, he was like, "Oh yeah, you could totally do this casting thing. Like, check out check out this server, BGG and Broadcast GG, and like, there's yeah. like resources and stuff. You could totally do it." And um, <clears throat> And so that was, I think, um, for me, some, the first thing that I had succeeded at in a very, very long time um, and felt that I had a future or that I had accomplished something, anything, right? And so um, that's, I picked up, left, left one addiction for another one. But, um, but yeah, so basically, like literally, the, I just swapped my life over to be 100% casting all the time. And back in the day when I was like, even more shitty than I am now, uh, uh, I would just wake up, browse, troll for scrims, find a scrim, cast it, then look back on it, try and find another scrim, rinse and repeat eight hours a day. All I did was try and learn more about Overwatch, try and learn more about casting, and it utterly consumed me. And um, because because I have an addictive personality, I'm always very wary of just like jumping into stuff because like you know it's really easy to become overwhelmed and just yeah. like all in on something that's not going to end up really getting you anywhere. And jury's still out, but uh, uh, I think I think uh, I got again very lucky with a lot of factors that helped me break out of it. I also started counseling, which I highly recommend for anybody who's struggling with um, uh, mental health. Because, again, like like I've said this whole time, nobody it, when when you're when you're in that pit, you 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 have to be the one to think yourself out of yeah. it. And while nobody can tell you just be happy, right? They can help. They can like bring you a ladder, right? to help you see what's really going on or to, to figure out or to just give you a different angle. Because for me, again, like when I'm relaying all of this stuff about my childhood and everything, like to me, that was just normal and it's not really normal or it's, it's a variant and the things that you didn't like that might be valid. Right. And the way that it affected you, you might not know at the moment until somebody's like, Hey, have you ever thought about your relationship with your parents and your sense of duty? Like, because because that was like vaguely maybe I knew that but to have somebody print it out for you right that's it's kind of like um you know playing Overwatch on a team with a coach right all of you had it within you but sometimes you just need a coach to come in here and be like how about try it this way or like you're really good at you know shatters we should put you on Ryan more or something like that and you just need that little extra bit of spark to to really unlock that potential and so for me counseling definitely helped um just be like you know, see above yourself for, for a second and not be so caught up in, in the whirlwind of it all in, yeah. in that moment. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, you you mentioned that your relationship with your parents was pretty strained. Is that something that's gotten better since all of these events occurred? You still have some rocky points where you're still trying to come, like there's still that huge divide of like cultural difference. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's always, it's always a process. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I, I think it's definitely gotten better. I think it's a lot healthier. Um, mm -hmm. If if nothing else, there's uh, give and take now. Yeah. Before it was very, it was a lot more unilateral. Um, and while I am not not being a parent myself, and no desire to, but uh, like I, I assume from what I know that being your kid's friend is not really is not a hundred percent the way that you should go about it because there yeah. needs to be some kind of guidance some kind of structure but before that was all there was like i couldn't talk about like i loved pokemon when i was a kid and i have no pokemon cards that boop was just showing me his collection the other day and i never got any pokemon cards it was i never got to watch pokemon um and, and that kind of thing because my interests were not part of me right yeah. like like it, it, that wasn't an aspect that you had to validate um, because, well, whatever, that's not going to get you into Harvard. <laughs> so I think now there's a lot more, my parents have a lot more respect for my wishes and desires. Obviously, everything that I want is not good, um, but there's something to be said like, oh, she uh, she really likes esports. How about she, we, we let her give it a go? Or, um, you know, she really likes uh, you know, eating bananas. I hate bananas, but you know, let's I'm buy more bananas. bananas. 
<laughs> oh, oh no. Uh, you never get to taste del- the deliciousness that is banana Laffy Taffy. It's gross. Um, oh, it's gross. I've had it's, it. It's I, 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 I eat bananas occasionally. I have to be careful because my lips swell up very much. So What? Like yeah. <laughs> banana bread and banana cream pie are two things that I will take allergy medicine with and then eat. So <laughs> not a smart thing to do. Uh, but, but it's it's I mean, delicious. every now and then it's fun. Yeah, no, Boop takes a Boop takes a medicine so he can drink because he's allergic to gluten. Every once in a while, you just gotta you just gotta yeah. take the dive. But yeah, so so, so I was gonna ask you, you, you came up with this like you grew up with this very cultured and restrained lifestyle, and you now you're a you're a public facing figure, um, which is an interesting dynamic uh, mm-hmm. being out there in front of everyone. Um, and it's definitely not for everyone. Um, yeah. I personally love it. I know a lot of people really like it. I like to be out in front of people. I've always kind of enjoyed it. That's why I was a musician for a while and stuff like that. But kind of looking oh, at that. Oh, what you play? I played, growing up, I played clarinet until I chopped off my fingers, and then I could not do that anymore. And then I play guitar, and I occasionally sing, but I'm not a very good singer. But for someone who has Aww. missing fingers, I can play guitar. So. No, that's awesome, though. And gu- guitar is like, because I also play clarinet, and I also play piano. And I definitely have to say, piano has lasted longer, because yeah. like guitar, it's something that you can just, you know, just strum to yourself, right? Yep. And you don't, you don't need the accompaniment of everything else moving around you to enjoy that music. So Yeah, I actually great. did music education for all, which is when I had Boop on the show, something that I kind of was like, oh, that's really cool. You also did music right? education. Mm-hmm. So I dropped, I switched back to psychology. But for a very brief moment, I was like, maybe I want to be a teacher. And I was like, no, I I, I don't. I don't want to be a teacher. I hate I, kids. I hate kids. I hate yeah. kids. Oh my gosh, dude! Because I also taught piano. I taught I taught piano through through college to mm-hmm. to uh, make some money. And yeah, no, I hate kids. <laughs> so, um, but one of the things you have to you have to admit is that you're in a public you're a public facing figure and you, your audience is fairly young. Like I would say that, mm-hmm. um, especially I think that you, you and Boop, I, I don't think you have the same audience demographic as everyone else. Um, no. And I, I feel like that's not necessarily a bad thing. Cause I feel like, like if, if there was anyone who I could say could be in front of Disney, like, and maybe this is terrible, but if there's anyone who could be a, a, a public facing image of like Disney and be on the Disney channel, I would say it's you and Boop. Call me. Call me Blizzard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we, I think that that's actually a really great point that you brought up. I'm curious if you if you chatted with Boop at all about this or if you brought it up because this is something that we've thought about a lot since, like you very astutely pointed out, it's probably super obvious is that we don't really bring in the same crowd as say even uh, even another uh, male female duo, say like Lemon and uh, Hurix, yeah. right? Um, so. A big part about being a public figure is figuring out your brand and your audience. And mm-hmm. obviously, I'm not. I'm personally really shitty at the social media game and selling myself and that kind of thing because uh, I could definitely um, get much more of a following, be much more successful if it put more time and effort into it. But um, it, it still is very important f- to recognize who you're speaking to and who you most easily speak to. And for us, <laughs> it's definitely the Disney crowd, the moms. Oh my gosh. Uh, so the other day, I had personal highlight. Bustio's mom sent me a heart on Twitch chat. Ah, oh. Bustio mom, and then there's Clone Man's mom, Manga Chu's mom, <laughs> Mama Chu who follows me, uh, and Beast Halo's mom follows me too. She was the first one to follow me. I'm just like, I love you all so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we are, yeah, we, <clears throat> you know, we uh, don't. I, I mean, it's it's. I mean, we don't like, we're not really into min-maxing. We're not uh, hypercritical. We're, we are not former players, right? Say like Avast is, right? Who has that connection. Um, I, I, I would say my brand is optimism and kind of just, and, and, and maybe it's a, uh, Maybe it's a little less lower, more lower level analysis. I don't, I don't think so necessarily. But uh, my focus anytime I'm casting is to make this as digestible and as easily understandable yeah. as possible. And that may, might mean not necessarily going into as deep of a history with, say, such and such player's background or, or that kind of thing. But the my goal is if you have never watched Overwatch before, I want you to keep wanting to watch Overwatch. Right. Mm-hmm. I want you to understand this enough so that the next time you're like, yo, that like Hammond thing was actually really cool. Like, it, you know, it, it provides a lot of mobility, but not a ton of point presence. Like now you feel like you, you have some yeah. knowledge, right, that you can apply to the next time. Do you ever feel like you can't connect 
with a younger audience because you don't understand the same things? Or do you feel like there's enough generation gap between that? Because obviously you didn't get to spend a lot of time with like, like a lot of the stuff, like our generation, because we're the same age, uh, which mm-hmm. is old as fuck, uh, relatively <laughs> speaking. In esports world, we're fossils, man. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're not, we're not quite fossils. Like they're definitely like, Jason Baker's a goddamn fossil. He's like a dinosaur. <laughs> Okay. Oh my god! I mean, he looks amazing. He He's does. like forty two now. He was, he was right? on the show. His his episode's very good. So oh. I had him on the show. So um, I but, have to, I have to check that out then. But I can't imagine like you probably can't always relate to like our generation because you didn't get to mm-hmm. you didn't you didn't get to do a lot of things. But is there enough generation gap where you can learn all the new stuff for the younger generations? Now that you're involved in it, because I can't relate to memes. I know, like I, I kid you not. Like we're like people meme, and I'm just like I have no idea what you're saying. Like I'm sorry. <laughs> like can you explain this to me in like an English language that I learned? Insert Steve Buscemi. Hello, fellow kids. Yeah, right. Basically. <laughs> I mean, no, that's that's totally me. And part of it is definitely like a little bit of reluctance on my my side because I, I'm not personally super interested in that. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm not a world class memer like a vast and but. <clears throat> Right. But my whole thing is you don't have to be right. Mm -hmm. This because the reason that you have two pairs on contenders is that you can cover your bases. Right. We're different. And that's good. Right. And if we were the same, then what's the point of having two pairs? Right. And and I think that's always something that uh, not just not just casters, but like, you know, producers and people who are like making these shows up. It's it's very important to keep that in mind because you always want to reach the broadest audience as possible. And for all the moms out there or for, you know, the the women and gays, that's me and Boop's demographic, the women and gays uh, that the, we're, we're here for you. Right. Like um, and. Yeah, no, I, I super struggle. Actually, it's really embarrassing, but I didn't even know what a Pepe was until, like, three years ago. <laughs> like, okay, so I, I, I know what it is, but even, I honestly, like, like, until recently, and I mean, like, a couple of weeks ago, I really didn't know what it was. I was like, why the fuck are people posting this frog everywhere? It literally... It's so ugly. <laughs> I was just right, like, what's it's not the even point? Cute. Like, yeah. <laughs> and I still yeah. see it occasionally, and, like, in context with, like, people post it in context to what other people say, and I'm just like, what, what are you trying to say right now? Because I don't, like... Like, I'm just like, what does this mean? Is there, I feel like I'm watching hieroglyphics and I never learned, like, Egyptian. Like, that's what it is to me. Exactly. Did you, did you like, were you on Reddit all the time or, or anything like no, that? Because I no. also... Yep, I, didn't get on, I, didn't, I didn't get onto Reddit until League of Legends, really. And so that would have been, like, like my third year, second, second, third year of college, maybe. Maybe even fourth year of college. Like, I was almost done before I really started getting into Reddit or social media in general. I didn't use, like, anything other than Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, same here, because, like, that that was also, like, I had a Reddit account from, like, several years ago, but I never went on, never made use of those communities yeah. or got used to the lingo or the culture or anything until literally, like, six months ago. <laughs> so, so dumb, and that that definitely didn't, um that di- doesn't help your transition into esports, right, where that no. kind of, like, <clears throat> it moves so fast, and if if you're, because I would literally, I would, like, be watching Twitch chat, trying to, like, read and stuff, and but everybody's memeing, and there's all the, the Kappas and the dance games, and the and I, I remember literally, like, watching, uh, I forgot what it was, like, Old Contenders or something, and, like, somebody put, like, a Kappa, and I was like, oh my god, this person, is this person gay? Because, like, because <laughs> I was like, Kappa Pride is the thing, and then I was like, no, that's totally different. And then by the time I had like figured out what it was and like literally Googled it, like chat had scrolled up so far, I didn't even remember what the original message was. And I was like, fuck shit. God damn it. I'm so slow. <laughs> so it was a process. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's still pretty rough for me. So I was kind of like kind of looking at that. And this is something that I asked uh, Boop too. So I kind of want to, hopefully he didn't tell you this question because this is one I kind of want to, like, I kind of like gauging just in contenders in general. Contenders looking from the outside in feels very um, what's closed off, I would kind of closed. Like, Contenders is different from OWL, and they're separated, yeah. and it feels mm-hmm. very separated. And it doesn't feel like there's a ton of upward mobility, right now at least, from Contenders to OWL. And I don't see there being any space um, from people moving from Contenders to, to OWL. Is this something that you've thought about or you're worried about, or do you think that it's not a big deal? Yeah, so uh, so I don't have personally a lot of information um, mm-hmm. in terms of what that path looks like, even if if there is even a path. Obviously, with um, theoretically, I know that like there's geolocation coming soon, yeah. 
Yeah, well, they, they so already announced they that, already announced all the the twenty twenty stuff, and they also announced uh, two 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 lock uh, that got leaked yesterday because mm-hmm. someone messed up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I, I feel like we all knew it was yeah. coming. I mean, through, it was leaked. Right? Like Jessica yeah. did an article, but uh, they announced I think roll queue today too, as far as like other things that I think that mm-hmm. got announced today. Uh, but they did announce that there was going to be a bunch of different homesteads where it's going to be traveling to different events. Right. So that is and s- and so that's kind of what I see as, as the path is like, okay, well, just you're going to have a ton of physical locations that you're going yeah. to need people to be in in order to cast those games. So yeah. that's that's one way to transition to OWL. Otherwise, I don't know. Um, uh, Wolf and Achilles obviously got the call this yeah. season. and um, But as far as like what that process looks like, who they're consulting in order to do that, I know Monty and Doa uh, did consultant work at least for the first season of OWL. And I don't know if that's... Uh, that contract has carried on into this season, um, mm-hmm. but I don't know if there's a path, if there is any path. And mm-hmm. personally, I've <clears throat> not necessarily resigned myself, but I expect to continue to cast contenders for quite some time longer because mm-hmm. there's um, what I see as one, the inherent disconnect, older, um, not typically the face that you see with esports. Yeah. I, I don't connect as well with you know the the people who are going to be buying the Legos and who are memeing in chat and everything like that. So it's going to take a while to work audiences up to the point where they they would maybe accept a, a duo like me and Boop. So that's a decision that they they need to weigh. Mm-hmm. And the other one is just um, like we we we're not as established. We haven't been yeah. doing this as long. And there's obviously that seniority and just extra level of experience that a duo like ZP and Avast bring that we don't bring. Yeah. So I'm personally not going to be super disappointed if um, if we just continue in the contender circuit mm-hmm. for quite some time because there's a lot to be said about you know gaining that experience and um, so that's that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. I guess I was going to ask you, kind of moving a little bit, shifting off that question. Uh, mm-hmm. Have you ever thought about like swapping games, like maybe when you get more experience or something in there? Because I feel like that's very common for casters, uh, mm-hmm. especially like they start out, they work, they work as far as they can up in one game, but then when a new game comes out that they're really passionate about, they kind of swap so that way they can because they already have previous casting experience. It's easier for them to shift a lot of those skills over and then just kind of really progress very quickly in that. And so, like a good thing is like Apex Legends. I know Jamerson, yep. like after uh, being let go from uh, contenders, that's what he jumped into. And he was like, okay, well, as long as I start doing this right away, I can, like, and very true, I think that he could be a very good Apex Legends caster. Um, so oh, yeah. kind of looking at that, do you ever think about like, what is the next game that we need to switch to? Because this will be better for us for op- upward mobility. Yes. Yeah, so this is, I feel like every caster should be able to cast, should have at least two games in their arsenal. Um if just for just for the fact that you're going to have find more opportunities and it's going to be easier to make money we all yeah. we all need money and yeah. uh, as as much as i would like it to you know contenders doesn't pay pay a ton of buckaroos so mm-hmm. um depending on who you are um but personally um i i, I don't know yet because there's I, I i actually had a conversation with hex quite some time ago um about if he would pick up another game and he said no because the reason that he casts, because he does not come from a sports casting background, um, he was actually a writer for Ghost Super Gamers for quite some time, mm-hmm. uh, two English degrees. <laughs> so um, he he was like he his his viewpoint, which is very similar to mine, is that my love for the game came first. That's what propelled me to cast. So if this game no longer draws me in the same way, I might just swap careers mm-hmm. and. Because uh, say say versus like the Ubers of the world, he started in CS:GO. Yeah. At, at a point, I remember one of his he was casting like 400 games a year. Yeah. That's a lot. What? That's insane. And yeah. and obviously honing his craft and everything, and he just transitioned those skills into Overwatch. Versus me, who I see it more as like this game. Uh, I'm passionate about it. It motivates me, and I love this game and that's why i want to break it down dive into analysis see why this went the way that it did and what could come the next time um uh and it suits my role since i'm color and um color generally has a harder time transitioning into other games because it requires very in-depth knowledge versus play-by-play which is you know you could if you have the mechanics you can cast almost anything right so that's definitely something that um that i've thought about because i think in order to 
uh, you know, give due respect to a game that I'm casting. I have to have that. Uh, my heart has to be in it. And I don't know. I have yet to find another game that propels me in the same way because Boop, Boop and I have been talking about this. He was in love with the latest Mortal Kombat and he was like, we got to break into the fighting game circuit. I was like, the fighting fighting game circuit is a is a great community, but from what I know of it, it's a little bit closed. You know, I it's yeah. a super diverse community, so we could definitely like we wouldn't have that initial hump to overcome. But I'm like, and he was like, oh, you know, it's gonna be so fun and blah 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 and everything and da da da. I, I don't know, my heart's not in it. And You're then like, I don't, I don't like, want to learn all the an- analysis of how they how they do these things, which I don't blame you. I I, I mean, it 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 seems really interesting, but for whatever reason, I just don't like it i don't like bananas right um and uh and then uh the next oh obviously we we looked into apex legends but we already had like say jamerson jumping on it and i think jamerson would be a great fit for apex and people had a head start so t and tft oh my gosh boop is upset he's playing it right now i i want to play it (laughs) <laughs> I want to play it, but I have—I just haven't had time lately, which is unfortunate. Dude, like, I'm doing dude you should absolutely do it because Boop will play with you. Doesn't matter when, he's always on. I bet you a million dollars he's playing it right now, oh, <laughs> and oh um, <clears throat> probably. And so he's like, "Oh, we got to team fight tactics and so on and so forth." I actually came so, from a league background. That's why I think that's why I like it so much because I stopped playing league mm-hmm. when I got into Overwatch. Because when I got hired, I was actually interviewing for all of League of Legends jobs. I wasn't—I mm-hmm. like—I didn't like Overwatch was not a thing that I. T- this is something that's kind of grown with me is I, I actually have never really cared about like like League of Legends was the game that I loved but as far as working in esports I don't really care where I work as I care about the people that I work with because they're similar uh, and that's I like the people who are in esports not necessarily the game the game doesn't really matter to me that much uh, which is weird very to say. interesting I know yeah. but my job is all about people and so I just want to work with mm-hmm. like the similar styles of people and they're that that is the only good thing about like my position that doesn't get hired anywhere else is that I can technically transition games uh, very easily uh, which is kind of cool but I so I love League of Legends and then I got into Overwatch and because I started working with Overwatch I started to love Overwatch and now this is the community like quite literally I grew 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 into because I was mm-hmm. working with gladiators and stuff and now I'm like I love these other communities too, and I want to start looking at more esports. And there's not enough time to look at every single esport, which is the problem. So. Right? Isn't it, isn't it funny that like these just these little games spark so so much in depth conversation? I've, you can like never really know everything, right? So, <clears throat> oh, yeah. that's so because because like the the cool thing about. <clears throat> The cool thing about that is like you can you can basically just go as the wind wills you, yeah. right? Because there was a lot of conversation um, like when when Blizzard first started doing Owl and Contenders and stuff. It's like if there's no third party, you and you want to do this game, you're locked into working with the developer, right? Yeah. Which for some people is a boon, for some people is not, right? Um, and and it it confers its own pros and cons, but you're yeah. kind of just like like take me yeah, wherever. Basically. <laughs> I mean, granted, I'm not getting hired a whole lot because no one wants to hire my position right now, which is understandable, but say la vie. Uh, so, I mean, that's kind of how it goes. Uh, how do you think about the contenders uh, contenders right now in the way that it's set up? Because I see it as being a problem. Like, I obviously do work with uh, a contender team slightly, but even before that, like, looking at things, I was like, uh, like, the way that the system's set up doesn't seem to be right. It, it's weird where it seems like they want academy teams, but then they also want open teams, but then it doesn't feel like they ever support the contender scene that much. Okay, yeah. which is kind of a, a big question for you, and I I imagine you will have to be very careful how you answer that. But what do you think? Do you think that that's true? Do you think there needs to be more direction? What direction would you personally like to see it be in? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's a tough, tough question. And when I was like, eh, like exercising my face, it's not because like I I need to like prepare my PR answer now, but I, I just it's really just a a hard question like i i don't know what the answer is and i i'm so so like what i see uh i I mean from my understanding no i'm not uh tied in very strongly with the teams and i only know what blizzard tells me but um it seems like they want the consistency and the reliability of a feeder system right so like ncaa into nba and there's just not the same infrastructure and there's not the same interest to support that easily, right? Because in, uh, you know, f- with like basketball, everybody love can pick up a basketball, start playing, and 
na naturally, all of these colleges have programs built up over time, right, that support this, and then you feed it. Yeah. Overwatch is trying to, like, build that from the top down. So we... So Owl gets the large proportion, obviously, of promotion and money and eyes and attention and that kind of thing. Um, so it's it's a little bit uh, the other way because there's no like the esports is just now becoming a thing with yeah. colleges, right? And so what the I just scratched myself. Um, what the colleges provide is obviously like, hey, we we're gonna just support your sport. And you don't have to pay tons of money. We're going to do it, yeah. right? And that's it's always a question of money. And so with the academy team system, you know, they want to give some perks so that owl teams will be incentivized to provide these academy to to support academy teams. But dude, there's really no money in it, from what yeah. I understand. You yeah. make money either by signing players to owl teams or trading them, and that doesn't happen all the time, and it's not very reliable. So it's hard to tell an organization that needs to be run as a business even if it's all passion and love and stuff you need money to keep the lights on right and it's hard to be like well just uh, essentially <clears throat> uh just spend a ton of money yeah. no guarantees right no uh, you know uh, uh, not a ton of structure right and the i think if you were to ask like what direction i would recommend contenders go again a really hard thing i'm not a business person but where to start would definitely be applying the rules transparently and evenly, and which is just something that hasn't been done so far, right? So Fusion University say that they're moving to Korea so that they can keep their Korean players because of the region lock, but Gladiators Legion has only three North American players. Yeah. They still compete. So, and in this case, it doesn't really matter, but that kind of uncertainty or the, is that really what's going on? It doesn't breed confidence for orgs and teams to invest, right? In a system that is already not making a ton of revenue yeah. um, and add on top of that, just you don't have any guarantees, um, which makes it really hard for people to to buy into that system, which theoretically on paper should work, right? People, kids play the game. They make a team in open division. The open division teams get into trials. The trials teams get into contenders and then the contenders players get absorbed into owl. Ah! But like along the way that, that means that you have to have maintain sustained uh, public casual interest, right? Yeah. It can be argued that Overwatch has the interest has waned, right? So if you, cause uh, I actually, um, I went to uh, Denver Comic Con for the first time just this year, and Boop was like, "Oh man, like everything's shifted to Marvel." And what he meant was um, all the content creators, all the artists, and people who were creating mm -hmm. merch used to be making diva shirts, diva bags, right? Like Widowmaker statues and paintings yeah. and so on and so forth. And now the public conscious has shifted away because you know it just happens with games, but like we we've lost some of that. So public interest isn't as large. This is an anecdote, but. Um, and and so because of that, not as many people are grinding on the ladder. We're not going to get necessarily as high quality of players or as passionate of players who are willing to put in that time and effort to um, you know work up to a semi pro level. Because of that, then the open division teams are not as strong. The interest is not as big. So then the tr teams that get into trials not as strong, uh, not as many. And then <laughs> those teams that get in contenders yeah. have a hard time competing. That's you know um, very simplified version and. Not necessarily, it's not a, that black and white, but um, I think on some level, that is one of the trends that we're starting to see. And <clears throat> so what do you do? Well, then you try and incentivize the academy teams to like put more money into, uh, the owl teams to put more money into the academy teams. And everybody has an academy team. So there's going to be a home for these players that do want to make it, but that's going to be very difficult because where's the money? Um it's it's a very difficult yeah. system because like it, you could either there there seems to be two ways. I obviously relative newcomer to esports, but what I've seen is it's either a top down developer pumping money into this system and putting everything in all the resources in to artificially create artificially uh, to to you know encourage the propagation yeah. of the league and so on and so forth. Or it's the other way. The community just loves this game so much, friggin' Dota. Like it doesn't matter what else happens, we're gonna have the the biggest prize pool in all of esports. It's happening, right? Like the international is the biggest tournament, esports tournament in the world, and and like Valve doesn't give a shit, right? But 
the people, the community want it, so they made it happen. And right now, Overwatch, obviously, Blizzard is putting a lot of money into the league, um, but so that might in in the, in the end, I think it's going to work out. I, I think it's just a matter of time before people come into it. But um, you know, you the community a, support is maybe a little lacking. Do you see a place for teams like uh, Second Wind, Phase Two, Square One? Do you think that they have a place inside this league, or do you think they're eventually going to get phased out? I hope they stay, but um, again, it's it's hard to it's hard to predict the future. I hope they stay because it's always it's always an amazing story to. Like, oh, uh, we, we've been talking, I've been talking a little bit more about the business side, but like as a viewer, right, what you want to see is not necessarily what you're going story. to see, right? Yeah. So like the underdog story, right? Second wind last season coming in with five ringers and taking the map. Obviously, I think it was like against Bermuda or something. So it, 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 it wasn't like that amazing, but five ringers, Frill coming in on Reinhardt of all things. And, um, and that's the kind of stuff that keeps, you know, the blood pumping, right? Yeah. And people wanting to tune in. I we never know if this is what's going to what's going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, David and Goliath, and there's uh, and again, there's um, something to be said about these orgs that are essentially because they have no, um, <clears throat> they don't have like a high overhead, right? So there's not as much risk for them just signing some guy off the ladder, right? Or having a ringer come in and maybe he's like a genius or a prodigy, and that's how they kind of get brought into it because they don't have to be like, oh well, if we like invest in this player maybe he's not going to get traded to owl and that kind of thing and so well we're just not going to sign him we're going to go for you know uh, uh say like pick up a former owl pro or somebody who yeah. you know uh, yeah, that kind of thing so i think there's a lot more um potential for those um, those kinds of stories and a lot more potential to develop undiscovered mm -hmm. talent with orgs like second wind phase two in in the mix of things yeah, I guess where I when I see it, I my my honest, I think the biggest criticism that I have for uh, kind of like contenders is the fact that like academy teams they kind of get a free ride, and I say kind of because mm -hmm. like at a certain point they get to come back into the league, um, at least as far as I know, uh, which I don't think is very fair to any team such as Second Win Phase Two Square One. Where I think would be cooler is if they said no, you can't be brought in, but if you want to buy out this other team. You're more than welcome to to do that. You're more than welcome to say, hey, listen, we'll pay you to do your thing um, and represent and we get first dibs on all of your players. Like, mm -hmm. I think that like that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that I, I feels very a lot of the system feels very one sided towards academy teams over other teams. And I guess that's the feeling that I kind of get is like Blizzard is always going to favor the people who are an owl over the, the, the people who put together a team and try to make a run for it. I don't have any information that leads no. me to believe otherwise, right? And uh, I, I mean, I understand from a business standpoint yeah. why you would want to incentivize that, exactly. but it yeah. does seem it does seem inherently unfair, right? Because it's the path to pro, not pros paving the path, right? Yeah. So, uh, but again, like <laughs> you and I, we don't make the decisions; we can only make That's these true. observations. Right. So, I mean. Whatever happens, fingers crossed that this has been a plan that's been thought out, not just for this year, but the next year and the next year and all the way down the line into the future that this is what's going to be sustainable. So we'll see. For contenders, would you like to see more lands happening? Is that something that yes. you think that you would enjoy and like to do? I personally would fucking love it. But every I and and okay, from a selfish standpoint, of course, then that means no. more opportunities to cast lands, which is always a ton of fun. Um, but I I I actually gave an interview to 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 um this effect a, a little while ago in that I, I think lands are so, so, so important for the development yeah. of tier two talent. Um and what I mean by that is when you're in T2, right, it already feels like you're on the back burner, right? You're like the broth that's just simmering there while somebody cooks up a steak, you know, uh, on like the big range. And and that feeling, obviously, just from, you know, a mental standpoint, makes it harder to show up to scrims and go for the grind when you feel like you're not the priority, right? Um, but in the public eye and developing viewership and everything, the lands are crucial because, you know, who who brings the most viewers to contenders? Streamers like Harblue, yeah. right? Um, and that's for a reason. It's because people know him, the person, not just the player, right? Yeah. They love him, his witticisms or whatever. And every time he lands a grab, it's not just Azaria landed a grab. It's like Harblue getting him, right? And they develop that personal connection. And if you take a look at the social media presence from many of these contenders players, I mean, they're they're just kids, right? Yeah. And 
you know, basement people like me and you, and maybe don't have a ton of uh, experience developing their personal brand. And, um, and the fact that nobody ever sees their face, nobody ever, you know, knows their thoughts and feelings. Um, they're not the ones who are going to be getting interviewed after their games, even though Lemon has an excellent series out oh, there where it's she's so good. I've right, right, uh, where where she interviews them after the games, and it's it's not a super long one, but it just gives you that extra little bit of insight. How did you feel after that, right? And it creates a rapport between the viewers and the players, and in terms of, um you know, creating that passion so that people want to turn up for contenders games. They want to watch, I, I don't just want to watch, you know, Atlanta uh, uh, stomp Grunto. It's because yeah. I like Gator, right? Yeah. That guy's so funny. He said a joke the other day that was hilarious or like he grew a new beard and that was funny or horrible or whatever, right? And and that's the kind of, uh, that's kind of what's missing in tier two because in OWL, everybody's, uh, you know, um, you get to know them and the teams are putting out little video packages about like, what's Gamsu's day like? Oh my God, Uni's so I have cute. Such, I have such high <laughs> criticisms for all that stuff because it all feels like just, I, I think that's the big difference that, that was one of the reasons why I started the show, to be honest, is mm -hmm. I was tired of seeing PR that was just, oh, this is it's everything. So manufactured. About, yeah, right. it's, it feels so fake to me and maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't think it's fake. I think it's probably one aspect of them and that's the only aspect that they want to show. And for me, that it's the whole that makes the person not one aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I've, I've always always kind of criticized all that because it doesn't feel like it's very genuine um, for for me kind of looking on the outside. But I completely understand like th this connection that we need to make with all these individuals and the people that are going here. So I actually yeah. had, I just came up with a question I should have probably asked earlier, but I forgot because uh -huh. it's just the the way the lay of the land works here. Um, obviously getting into esports was something very traditionally different from your life and probably your parents plan for your life. Okay. Yeah. Were they okay with this? No, not even a little bit. Uh <laughs> Um, and, and like, uh, you, you were asking me about my future and owl and so on and so forth. And I'm, I, again, because I, I love this game and not, and as much as I love casting and performing, I would be totally fine. I'm actually planning on going back and getting yeah. my degree and everything because unfortunately we all need money for clothes and food yes. and everything. And, and the reliability is something that I still, I still need to find. Um, but I'm going to, I'm, man, I'm, I'm riding this train until it, until it bucks me off. So, um, but in terms of getting my parents to come around to it, I think something that really helped was they saw how much I was struggling and how direct, directionless I was for, for so long, because while, you know, I, if, if I got accepted to Harvard medical school tomorrow, I would go. Right. Okay. But that's not going to happen. And, uh, and at my age, time becomes a very valuable currency. Yeah. And even though I could find the resources and I could find the support to go back to school and pursue a medical degree, that might not be what's most valuable. So um, I, I kind of had to walk them through that because they were like, oh, you're still so young and everything. I mean, they're in their 50s and they think anybody younger than 40 is yeah. so young. Um, <laughs> um, but like, you're so young, you could totally go back to school and everything. I'm like, yeah, I, that that's part of the plan. But right now, like this is, I'm making money, right? Um, and this is something that I just love to do so much. Like you can, they, they, start, they can see the difference in how, um, and just it just my how I am in daily life with casting and everything and having kind of like that goal, even though right, we're perfectionists and it's never enough, but at least you you know where you're going and it's up. Yeah. And I think I think that would that really helped. And I think like talking to them and and telling them like, hey, other people have done this and this is this is what they do and so on and so forth. It, it becomes a little bit of a le uh, less of an unknown. And I think that helps assuage some worries, even though my dad is constantly still like, come back to China. Uh, help me s set up this investment company. You have you have a mind for finance. I'm like, I do. But, you know, right, like, yeah. like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to <laughs> um, do finance, please. Thank you, dad. I, I could make many money, but sometimes the money is not oh, everything, right? So um, I it, it was it was definitely a long and, and tedious road, though, because I still don't think that they think that this is a job. Um, I I asked them to watch because they're like parents who like don't show up for your concerts or anything oh. like that. I have to you have to ask them to, and so I asked them to watch one of my broadcasts, and I think like seeing with their yeah. eyes that a logo, right? 
she's wearing a headset like talking and stuff and like people are watching like that kind of made it real um even though my dad's like come back to china <laughs> so yeah okay so believe it or not that's basically like we, i've asked you a ton of questions and i just want to say thank you so much for being on the show like it's been oh, wonderful I mean, to have you yeah. on the show i think i hope you've had fun at least some fun yeah. probably a lot of emotions but also some fun no, um, it's it's good to talk about these things, and I I think your show fills a really important niche. Yeah, so kind of kind of looking at that, I I have one last question for you. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a very easy or hard question depending on who you are. Um, having had <laughs> what the experience, what is your being... favorite color? Blue, no red. Ah! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh God, I love that movie. Um, everyone yeah. else is like, what movie are they even talking? What about? were you talking about? We're like transported back to like band camp, right? We're like oh, watching yeah. it on the bus and shit. Anyways, okay, yeah. So, okay. Uh, having had the experience being on this show, if you could pick anyone to be on the show, the only criteria is they have to be involved Ooh. in esports and they have to speak English because I don't speak other languages. Who would you pick? Oh, that's. I I would love it if you interviewed Tanello. Okay. So uh, Felipe Tanello is a s Brazilian Overwatch caster. He's color too. And he is not only a very lovely and nice, kind person who will just lay his life bare for you because you asked. Um, <laughs> he, he's just such a funny dude. I met him in person at uh, BlizzCon last year and um, had a ball. And like, I, I would, you know, I would love to know more about his personal story. Yeah. Okay. I actually, I think I watched the interview you did, you did with them when I was researching him because that's I spend a yeah. ridiculous amount of time researching my guests because uh -huh. I don't really write up questions and so that's the best way I can come up with questions on the spot. Um, that's actually awesome though because like that that one shows true dedication, right? Like that that uh, and no. two, I think it produces this quality of interview that that you're you. just you just it, it feels like you know before you even know. So, uh, I, I don't normally give shout outs. If you want shout outs, you can have them. Uh, this is your floor if you would like them. If not, then I'll just close out the episode, but go ahead. I mean, if you're looking for more Ham Tornado content, you always follow me on Twitter, Ham underscore underscore Tornado. Some dingus took all the normal versions. So, yeah. Premier. There's two underscores? Meet. Yeah, there are two underscores. Because when I was I'm first making it. Oh, oh, no! How I, could you? How could I you, Blake? No, I'll fix it. It's, <laughs> right? Post edit. I can post edit. Yeah. Oh, no. it's, we're doing it live! Uh, no, but um, yeah, so just just follow me on Twitter. That's where I post most of my stuff and like, you know, shitty pictures of a butt cherry that I found or, you know, whatever, the musings of a deranged mind. But uh, yeah, so that's where you can find me. Okay. Thank you so much for being on the show, Ham. I appreciate it so much. You've been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah. For everyone who else who's been watching this, my name is Blake Panashevitz. This has been Deep Dives into the Minds of Esports. And until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful day. And we're good. <laughs>